I have heard and read several Glitch in the Matrix stories that kind of prove that both cats and dogs exist outside of the confines of the Matrix. But I have a bird that seems to be able to operate outside of it as well. I have two cockatiels that have been together since they were hatched, and I came into them a few years ago. The pair are two boys, one named Froggy and one named Chipper. Yeah, I know that they're dumb names, but it's what the previous owners had called them and I'm not going to change them now. Chipper is a fairly calm and normal bird. He's really sweet and very friendly, but also very patient and calm while being handled. Froggy, on the other hand, is the exact opposite. He doesn't mind being held or handled, but he is energetic as hell. He likes to fly around as much as he can, he sings any chance he gets, and he also likes to nip at people for the fun of it. He's also the one of them that I personally believe is able to do things that he should not be able to do. What's weird is that he's done the same thing twice, but in the opposite way. It'll make sense here in a few minutes. The first time that he confused me happened about six months ago. I had both Froggy and Chipper out of their cages while I was home working because they like to walk around. And I have the room cleaned up enough that they won't cause any problems. I let them out of their cage during the day, but I don't let them out of their room. And they're pretty well happy with this arrangement. So, I was working in the room with them, doing what I needed with Chipper sitting on my shoulder and whistling randomly, when I noticed that Froggy was nowhere to be seen. I looked around in all of his hiding places, under the desk, on top of the bookshelf, and then I turned around to look, and I noticed that he was in his cage, dozing off on his perch. It confused me because... There was no way that he could have gotten back into his cage. I close it up when they're out, so that they're kind of forced to stay out of it for a while. I just accepted that maybe I had left the door open and he figured out how to close it, and I just didn't notice it. It wasn't like me at all, but I accepted the possibility for that event. It was the second thing that Froggy did that confused the hell out of me. A few days after that, I had a pretty bad headache in the middle of the day, somewhere around noon, so I decided that I needed to go ahead and get them back in the cage while I took a short nap. I get them in, I lock the cage, and I shut the door to the office where the cage is. Then I go to the couch to lie down. I fell asleep for a little while and then I woke up to a bit of a pinching feeling on my nose. I opened my eyes confused, and I look down, and what do I see but Froggy sitting on my chest and nipping at my nose. Then he makes his little chirp song when he notices I'm awake. It took me a few moments to really have what was happening click. At first I chuckled at it because I thought it was cute that he was waking me up, but then it clicked that he shouldn't be out of his cage, nor should he be in the living room. I pick him up off of my chest and I sit up, and then I look over to the office. The door was shut, like completely shut and latched. I thought that maybe the door could have just shut itself with the weight of the door, despite the fact that that has literally never happened, and I just went to go get him back in his cage. Much to my surprise, his cage was still shut and locked, and Chipper was just sitting there staring at me like, why is he out and I'm not? The whole time, I'm trying to get Froggy back in the cage. He's sitting on my shoulder, bouncing up and down and singing like he was just happily celebrating a victory. I honestly have no idea how we got out of the cage, much less the room. The cage door was latched and the room door was also shut, so I don't see how the little dude could have gotten out, but he did. At this point, 
I'm just assuming that Froggy has mastered the art of teleportation through the Matrix. And because he's a simple little guy, he just uses that power to get into and out of his cage for the fun of it. I have a pretty mundane glitch that was actually kind of creepy, and something about it was seriously unsettling, but I'm not really sure what the heck it was or what it was about. What's worse, it wasn't just me that experienced it. My boyfriend also saw the whole thing play out. It actually happened just the other day, so the whole thing is still pretty fresh in my memory. I was downstairs in the laundry room trying to fill the washing machine with the load of laundry, and when I got to the end of the current basket, I determined that there was a bit more space left in the machine. I yelled at my boyfriend to bring down another basket so I could finish filling it. He runs up to grab one, and then rushes back downstairs to get it to me. I start loading the clothing into the machine, and I get it all filled up. And as soon as I closed the lid on the machine, the light in the laundry room seemed to go out. I kind of screamed as it scared me, mostly because of the timing, and my boyfriend just laughed at me mentioning that the breaker must have tripped or something. I asked him to go check, and he then went over to where the switch was, and commented that it had been flipped to the off position. That was obviously weird, as we were both there by the washing machine, but it wasn't a huge deal. I thought maybe I just didn't flip it all the way on, and the timing was impeccable. Then it got weird. My boyfriend flipped the switch back to the on position, and as soon as the light clicked on, the room was filled with the brightest flash of light that I have ever seen. It was as if someone had taken the flash from one of those Kodak cameras and turned it up to 11. What was weirder was that it wasn't just a flash and then it was gone. It was a bright flash and then it was like it was fading in slow motion. Like it was dialed up and then someone was slowly turning it back down. As the light faded, I saw what looked like silhouettes of a person walking from the door to the washing machine and then saw them loading what looked like clothing into said washing machine. And then I saw a second silhouette walking back down with another basket of clothing. It took me a few moments to realize what I had seen, but I was basically watching what had just happened in some sort of detailless playback form. After a few seconds, the whole thing played out and it was over, and then the light was gone. I just stood there staring at the room and then looked over to my boyfriend, but the look on his face screamed what I was thinking. I asked him if he had just seen what I saw, and he just kind of nodded like, yep, let's not talk about it ever. I said okay, checked to make sure the washer had kicked on, and then walked toward the door to go back upstairs. We both went up and just didn't talk about the freaky event that we had both witnessed. Unfortunately, that's the whole story. We both saw this play out and haven't really discussed it because it was weird, and neither one of us has seen anything like it since. The laundry got done as normal, if anyone cares, and the basement still feels like a completely normal room. I have no idea what that was, But if anyone has any thoughts, please do feel free to share them. I have never in my entire life experienced anything remotely like what has just happened to me now. And also, I'm not crazy. I finished work at around 10.15pm so it was pitch black and I cycled home. It's roughly a 25 minute cycle back to the house, and as I got into my little town, I was approaching the crossroads in which I go straight ahead at when I'm cycling home. Upon approach to the crossroads, the light is red, 
but I'm still a good 10 to 15 seconds away from it, so I continue at the speed that I'm going. I see another cyclist coming towards me on the other side of the road from the direction that I'm headed and speed over the crossroad. As he's approaching me, I see he's wearing the exact high-vis helmet and jacket as me, as well as the same red backpack. By this point, the lights had turned amber and then green, so I thanked my luck for not having to stop, and kept going at the same speed that I was going at. Just as I was on approach to the green light, this other cyclist was right in front of me, but on the other side of the road and passing me. As he passes me, he says, Careful, mate. In my voice. My exact voice. Also, I'm not from the country that I live in, so my accent is very unique, and it was the same tone of voice and everything. I stopped my bike and turned around, no traffic behind me as the roads are dead at this time of night, and he had vanished. There was no way he could have turned down a side road or made it so far that he was out of sight. He mysteriously vanished. I turned back around to begin cycling again, and all of a sudden a car sped across the road at around double the speed limit, running a red light. If I hadn't stopped to look at this mysterious person who looked and sounded exactly like me, I'd have been hit side on, and likely died. I don't believe in anything supernatural, and I'm not religious, but this is making me question some things. I think if this person hadn't just vanished after the warning, then I could answer it as a very unlikely event that someone who looks and sounds just like me had maybe seen the car approaching. But he vanished. One day, I was on the way to my girlfriend's house when a glitch happened to me. I frequently visited her house from time to time, and one day she was quite upset that she'd had a fight with her best friend of 11 years, so she'd wanted to see me as soon as possible. At that time, I was working, and it was Saturday, so I had half a work day. I told her that I would only be free after 6pm because I had to run a few errands, and also I exited my work way later than I anticipated. She was adamant that I come straight to her house after my work was finished, so I left work at 4pm, it's 1pm normal exit time on Saturdays, so as I'm getting my motorcycle going, I call her and tell her that I'm coming to her house just like she wanted. I reach her house at precisely 4.48 p.m. I remember that, because I had just gotten a notification on my phone, and when I pulled my phone out to check what it was, it was obviously a spam message, but the time read 4.48 p.m. Then, I opened up the gate and I entered the house, and there she was with her face quite red. She says, where were you all of this time? I told her to just calm down and that I was at work earlier, and she replied telling me that I told her I left work at 4pm, and now it was 6pm. She pointed at the clock in her house. I jokingly said that I thought the time on her clock was wrong, and she blew up on me, and then I pulled out my phone to show her that it was only 5pm. But, unfortunately for me, the clock on my phone also read 6.03pm. I was dumbfounded, and I had no answers for any question that she had. I had just missed out on an hour of my life without any explanation. I just wanted some answers, but up to this day she hasn't accepted what happened. This is one experience with glitches in the Matrix that I personally encountered, and whoever you are listening or reading this story, please 
Have a nice day. So, I've been lurking here for a while, and I decided I would post something that happened to me about a year ago. I think you guys might find it interesting. I don't understand what the hell happened at all, and still to this day I cannot shake it. I was in the garage one night about a year ago. Now, my garage connects to the house through a door that I usually keep open, as I tend to go in and out all night working on things. From the garage, you can, from close to the door, see straight up to the back door of the house. It's a small townhouse, and is basically a straight line. So, I was working on the desk in the garage, the TV was off as I was close to finishing up for the night, and going to bed. As I was looking at my projects on the desk, I heard a noise from the kitchen. I'm pretty used to the cat jumping through plastic bags and thought nothing of it for a second. I looked over at a box, and the cat was sitting on top of it fast asleep. It was at that moment my dog starts barking from the lounge room, which is just beyond the doorway to the garage. So, thinking not much of it, he barks randomly all the time, if something falls off the bench, etc., I went towards the garage door. As I approached the doorway, the dog was barking much louder. I hear what I can only describe as loud, heavy footsteps start running from the kitchen across the tiles toward the garage, and I mean I can hear it clear as day. My first thought of this is, it's a threat, so I put my hands up ready to throw a punch at whoever comes through the door, and it just stops. Nothing. The dog is still barking, but nothing. I waited a few seconds and thought, oh hell, he's waiting for me. So I grab a piece of pipe and went through the doorway carefully, ready for some robber to jump at me. But it's nothing. There's no one there. The dog's watching me like nothing happened. It took me only a few minutes to realize that the house was locked up, and only myself and my fiancé who was in bed upstairs were there. As I went over it in my head, I realized something. Important detail to note, my family has very heavy footsteps, like annoyingly so. If I'm upstairs, I have to walk carefully as I'm basically thumping across the floor with my heel usually. The footsteps sounded exactly like mine. The heavyweight heel-like running sounded exactly like mine, I even ran from the kitchen to the garage again a few days later to see if it sounded the same. A year later, I can't shake it. Something or someone mimicked me, or it was me. I know my own footsteps and they were 100% mine, but I sure as hell don't get it. So, at the end of the last school year, my daughter, I'll call her Grace, graduated elementary school. As the kids were saying goodbye to their friends for the summer, some of the parents were standing around and exchanging numbers so the kids could set up times to see each other. One of my daughter's closest friends, let's call her Kate, is being raised by her grandparents. Well, grandmother and step-grandfather. The grandfather introduced himself as Bob and asked to exchange numbers, which we did. I didn't talk to the grandmother as she was turned away talking to someone else, and I didn't get a good look at her. A couple weeks later, we had arranged for the girls to get together. I went to their house to drop off Grace. The woman looked familiar to me, and she recognized me. She had dated a man I knew named Bob, but not the Bob that I met and exchanged numbers with. He was a very close friend to one of my close friends. Let's call my friend Liz. Liz and I did everything together for years, although we had a falling out and hadn't spoken in about five years or so at this point. But... 
when we were tight, we were always together, and she moved in with me for a few months after her house had burned down. Bob was a member of her church, and a very close friend to her. We were younger than Bob by about 10 to 15 years, but she had a major crush on him, which he didn't return, but still stayed close with her. We went on camping trips together. He was in my house several times. We played cards together. I was at his house several times. So, when I say that I would instantly recognize him on sight, I cannot overstate the fact that there is no way I wouldn't know him if I was standing and talking directly to him. Plus, he would recognize me and would talk to me in a familiar way. So, now the grandmother is standing there reminding me how much we know each other. She dated Bob for a bit. She'd played cards at my house, and I'd seen her at his house. It was just a few times, almost a decade ago, but I did recognize her as someone that I knew. And as far as I knew, she and Bob had split up. So when she mentioned her husband, Bob... I thought it was funny that she had married another man named Bob, but it's a common name, and the man I spoke with and introduced himself to me as Bob like we were meeting for the first time was not the Bob that I knew. He had snow white hair and the round paunch that elderly men get. He was soft spoken and he looked like a generic grandfather. He had no resemblance to the Bob that I knew at all. Except the next time that I saw the grandmother, the girls saw a lot of each other, so we saw each other regularly, she again mentioned Bob, and referenced something the five of us, her, Bob, my husband, and I, along with Liz, had done together. I was confused. She just said that she married the Bob that I knew. I started asking questions in the guise of just catching up. Yep, she meant the Bob that I knew. She told me that they had split when she started taking her grandchildren in, because their mother was neglecting them and she had to fight for custody. She didn't think Bob would want to start over with toddlers to raise them in his mid-sixties. It turns out that he did. He asked her to marry him and raise the children together. Which totally sounds like the Bob that I know but not the Bob that I met at the school and had spoken to, and neither of us recognized each other, which would have been impossible. But, sure enough, the next time I was there, Bob was home. Salt and pepper hair, fit for a man in his 60s, rugged, very distinctive looking. He greeted me like I had just seen him the other day, and spoke to me in the familiar way that I would expect from him. This was not the man that I spoke to at the school, and exchanged numbers with. I have no explanation. And no, it wasn't the real grandfather, as the grandmother's first husband had passed away many years before I met her. I stated that he was the step-grandfather at the beginning. I know this is long, sorry. So, who did I talk to, and give my number to if it wasn't Bob? The number I had been using to contact the grandmother, and from which she had contacted me, was the one that I got. I wish I had gotten a good look at the grandmother that day, because I think she wasn't the same person either. But like I said, I didn't get a good look at her, so I can't be sure. And why would Bob introduce himself to me like he didn't know me, when we clearly recognize each other on sight? This isn't the only really weird thing that has happened to me, but this one's bothering me a great deal. To be clear, they have no idea about any of this going on. From their point of view, nothing is amiss. There was not a different grandparent, or uncle, etc. that was there that day, as the biological grandfather passed away, and the other set is not in the picture. And... There's no other relatives involved. They're on their own raising four grandchildren. It's not a scam. We live in a very small rural town and everyone knows each other. 
And the girls have a couple other close friends in the group, and the other mother and grandmother, one of the other friends is also being raised by her grandparents, all frequently talk to each other and are constantly shuttling the girls between each house. I will make one note that may or may not have any relevance. My friend Liz knew Bob through church, and the grandmother also attended. That's how they all know each other. They were all very devout and deep into the church and religion, which isn't my scene at all. I made mention of their church, and the grandmother told me they were attending a different church and that they loved, which struck me as unusual considering how into the church community they had been. It would have taken something significant to make them drive 30 minutes to a different church instead of the one in town. Most people change if they have a fundamental difference on doctrine, they don't like the pastor or there's personal drama among the congregation. Which isn't to say that none of these happened. I kind of wonder if my former friend Liz, who had had such a crush on Bob, had made things awkward for them once they got married. Which may be the case. But it's still kind of strange. Edit. I asked one of the mothers whom I'm friendly with, and a grandmother of the girls' friend groups. There's four of them that are close and spend a lot of time together. Both of these women assured me that Bob, the one I have always known, was in fact at the graduation. So, they saw the same Bob as always with the grandmother. The grandmother who was raising one of the other girls had known them for a bit, as their granddaughters had youth group together. The other mom had met them before, but didn't have their number and also exchanged numbers with Bob that day. So, lately, I've been hearing a lot of stories about breathing underwater. This is mine. When I was about eight years old, I took swimming lessons. One of our lessons consisted of going as far down as you could into the deep end, which was 12 feet deep. There was maybe about five or six of us doing this. We would hold on to the side of the pool, take a deep breath, and then swim down as far as we can. I remember doing this, but maybe about six or seven feet down, I started to realize I needed oxygen and could not go any further. But, to my amazement, I took a breath and I was fine. Like, I actually breathed in water. There was no pain. It was like I was breathing in air. I opened my eyes and looked around underwater to see if anyone else was seeing this craziness. But everyone else was still doing their own thing and not paying attention to me. I thought I was losing my mind. It was like a dream. I couldn't believe it, but it was happening. As far as I can remember, I went down a few more feet still breathing water. I'm almost certain that I didn't make the whole 12 feet because my ears started popping, so I quickly swam up to the surface. I looked at my swimming instructor who was standing over us waiting and making sure that we were okay, but I could tell by the look on her face that she obviously had no idea the craziness I had just went through. I still think about this every day, and I'm 27 now. I know that this happened. I don't tell many people because I don't want to seem crazy, but I promise that this happened, and hearing other people share their versions of breathing underwater, it definitely inspired me to share my story. So, thanks for listening. Don't be scared to share your stories. Crazy, unbelievable things do happen, and there are people out there who will believe you. A couple of days ago, I was leaving my apartment to go to dinner with my parents. I stepped out the front door and locked the door behind me, but caught a glimpse of something in the corner of my eye. 
I turned my head to face the apartment complex across from my building, and there are two children. A girl, maybe six, and a boy, maybe four. They're standing completely still on the stairs and staring at me. No parents in sight. It immediately freaked me out, but I waved because I figured they were just nosy kids who liked to stare. But they didn't wave back or move at all. I turned my head to walk away and head to the stairs in my building, and I catch a glimpse of another person. A woman on her third floor porch, standing and facing me, staring and unmoving just like the children. It skewed me out really bad, so I moved fast to the stairs to get to my car, and when I get down the stairs to the sidewalk of the parking lot, there's a red car pulling out of its space to drive off. As soon as I look at the driver, he stops in his track, right in the middle of the road thingy, and just stares at me. Then, after a pause of me standing there in fear, he backed up back into his spot and sat there and watched me as I walked to my car. I'm thoroughly frightened at this point, and I jump in my car and lock it immediately. I crank it and take a deep breath. I look up from the wheel and across the sidewalk and grass in front of me, there's a woman pushing her toddler on her cart. Except, they're not moving, and they're both staring at me through my windshield. I start to panic a little, and I text my roommates to tell them what's happening and that I'm scared, and when I look back up from my phone, everyone and everything is moving again like it's normal. The lady with the toddler shyly waves at me because I'm staring at her in fear. The guy in the red car pulls back out of the spot and drives away. Everything just paused and focused on me for less than five minutes. And it was horrifying. It's, I don't know how to explain it. I was getting worried that I had something weird on me or that I was falsely accused of something. It was really freaky and I hope to not experience it again. Having binge listened to a large portion of the Glitch in the Matrix stories here on the As the Raven Dreams channel, I thought I would share just a smidge of my reality shifting life. The first thing I want to make clear is that glitches in the Matrix are very much a part of the phenomenon known as the Mandela Effect. I've been disappointed to hear people being rejected from Mandela Effect pages is not relevant. A change in your reality is a Mandela Effect, and there are many wonderful channels online if you're interested in connecting with people just like you who have extraordinary experiences. That being said, for me, middle-aged woman from England, it began in 2015. For me, McDonald's changed to McDonald's, and someone pulled me up for my spelling, which I laughed at, at first. But then I began to notice that all of the McDonald's fronts changed from red to green. I mean all of them. No disruption to the service while painters up and down the country rushed to paint the fronts of all the premises. They just simply changed suddenly to green. I did mention it to people who didn't seem to notice or care, and I just went along with it. That was the beginning of years of wondering why certain logos and brand names had changed, and it wasn't until three years later that I had my next uh, encounter with reality. I was walking through my hometown with my grandson. Now, bear in mind, my hometown is very old and has buildings of historical importance. The chief judge in the regicide of Charles I lived there, and we have something called blue plaques which adorn buildings of national importance nationwide. As we were walking down the main street, I noticed a beautiful black iron plaque about 18 inches long embedded in the ground outside of a shop which was circa 1400. The plaque outlined the long history of the shop in beautiful gilt writing, 
Oh, isn't that beautiful? I exclaimed, adding, The council have surpassed themselves there. We walked across the road to the 500-year-old pub where the chief regicide of the king worked and served his articles. The building has a blue plaque on the wall because, of course, this is a building of national importance. As we crossed the road, I could see that, there, embedded in the pavement, was another splendid black plaque stating the history of the building. I commented to my grandson that, it's beautiful, but that building already has the blue plaque, and it says the same thing. We walked on, discussing the town's history. A few days later, I was walking past another building, which now sits beside the bypass, but had been the town's registry office. My youngest daughter had been registered there before it was shut, and the registry moved out of town. It was now a wedding boutique. I didn't know anything more about the history of the building until I noticed the black plaque sitting outside of the building, again, embedded in the pavement, again, in beautiful gilt writing. The plaque told me that it had once been a cottage hospital, built in 1866. I admired the plaque and was happy with the new knowledge that it had given me. I don't live in my hometown and it was a number of weeks before I was, once again, walking through my town center. I walked around the corner and stopped in my tracks. No black plaque. I rushed towards where I had clearly seen it embedded, and there was nothing there. And I mean, nothing. No mark in the pavement to indicate it had ever been there at all. Nothing. Not a silch. The two other plaques had also disappeared with no sign of their existence at all. I don't know what the bloody hell was going on. I didn't know about the Mandela effect or glitches in the Matrix at that point, and I told my husband what had happened. He thought I had just had a dream. I explained that the plaques had been there over the course of a few months, and that I read that the wedding dress shop on the bypass was the cottage hospital built in 1866. How could I know that from a dream? He thinks I had a psychic dream. He worried my daughter about it. I visited the town hall to find out some history about the building, and sure enough, it was the cottage hospital built in 1866. There have been uncountable changes in reality. Glitches in the Matrix, Mandela effects, same thing. Why and how? Nobody knows, but some big stuff is going down and we're in it together. Share the love, beautiful people, and thank you for your time. Whatever that is. <laughs> this happened a few years back when I worked for a fairly popular pizza place. The location I worked at was a bit strange, as it had a lobby with a full buffet for lunch, but dinner? It was only takeout and delivery, because the manager had decided that we didn't get enough business for us to do table service in the evenings. I used to work the last shift, which was pretty much 4pm to 10pm, but I would typically be there until midnight helping clean up the store. Those last couple hours were, for the most part, dead. When it came to business at this store, the nights were pretty much 99% deliveries and then 1% carryout. So after a certain point, I would help stock up supplies, do dishes, and then sit on my phone watching YouTube until we could do the closing tasks. On this night, I heard the door chime go off around 9.50. So... I got up from the seat in the back and headed up to the front of the store to see if it was a customer or a driver coming in the front door for whatever reason. As I round the corner, I see a man that is very noticeable, mostly because he looks like he's the important corporate type. He's wearing a nice suit jacket with a button-up shirt, but then also wearing jeans and what look like cowboy boots. Honestly, he stood out. People around here don't really wear boots like that, because we're a fairly suburban area outside of a decently sized city. 
I made small talk and took his order, and he ordered two large pies, two orders of breadsticks, and a cinnamon dessert thing that we had, and then a few two liters of soda. It was a decently sized order, so I told him it would be about 20 or so minutes, but since he was the only customer or order at the time, it would probably be a bit less. We get the food put together, I make one of the pizzas and get the breadsticks in the first oven rack, the other cook gets everything else together and we move through it pretty quickly. Once it's all done, I put it on the counter in front of the customer and open the boxes, and he says it all looks good. I ask him if he wants help carrying it all out because it is a lot of food, and he says that he can get it all. He grabs the two boxes and the two bags with the other items and heads toward the door. I thank him and tell him to have a great night, and as soon as I hear the door chime, the other cook shouts at me that I forgot to bag the cinnamon dessert. I shout an expletive and grab the box it's in, and I immediately run to the door to get it to him. I want to mention that the time between the chime going off of him leaving the store and me grabbing that box, it was less than five seconds, and it was probably only another five to get to the door, so... There was no way for this guy to have gotten all of his food in his car, gotten in the car himself, gotten the car started, and then driven out of our parking lot. But he was literally nowhere to be found. There was only one exit to our lot, but there were no cars leaving. There were no cars parked. Nothing. This guy was nowhere to be seen. I noticed that one of our drivers was off to the side having a smoke break, and I asked him if he saw a guy walk out, and described the customer. He literally said that no one had walked out of the building for a while, and he'd been outside for about 15 minutes. I knew that this was accurate, because he'd asked if we needed help with the order that we were making for the guy, and when we told him that we had it, he told us he was going to take his break. I have no idea where the hell this guy could have gone. How he could have just vanished like this. How he got out of the building and off the property that quickly. Unless he had some sort of teleportation power or something. But the poor guy never got his cinnamon roll thing that we made for him. And he never called to let us know that we forgot it. I do feel awful because it's seriously delicious. And he definitely missed out. But... The Matrix decided to move him from this existence to another one, I guess. It's really hard to make a coherent story out of this, but I hope some people would comment if they're experiencing the same phenomenon. I need to know this is something real that others experience too. It seems to me that the Matrix is messing deliberately with me when I drive my car, and by putting other drivers on the road to pass my path on very exact moments. Let me take an example from yesterday. I've been having trouble with my sleep pattern, so last night around 1.20am, I left to go night shopping at a 24-hour grocery store. When leaving my street, I have an intersection that at daytime, is moderately busy, but at nighttime is very, very quiet. Sometimes there is only a night bus once an hour driving through it. Still, at 1.23am, when I drive to the intersection, a random car appears so that I need to stop until it passes, as it has the right of way. A little later on the same street, I'm approaching another intersection that is only used by employees of a certain company, and a car again appears and I have to wait, because during the nighttime, it's a radar-controlled traffic light intersection, and the other car triggered a red light for me. This happened in the middle of the night, when there's probably one or two people working at that company's night shift. It makes no sense to me that these two cars would decide to start driving so that they just randomly appear at the same location and at the same time with me. I don't buy it being a random occurrence, 
especially when this happens to me at least several times a week. Also, this phenomenon shows up when I'm buying something perishable from a store. For example, frozen foods that can't be refrozen after getting too warm, or I'm transporting my medicine from pharmacy that has to be kept cold during transport, but it must not freeze. I always get stuck behind a car that is driving considerably under the posted allowed speed. Usually, it's a bigger vehicle like a garbage truck, tractor, street sweeper, etc. This happens to me every single time. Every. Single. Time. I can't remember when was the last time that it didn't happen, and it's driving me mad to be honest. What really gets me is that, when I try to speak about this with other people, they dismiss it as me paying only attention to those incidents when it happens, and ignoring the drives when everything is going smoothly. I can assure you that this is not the case. Sure, I would expect this kind of thing to randomly happen every now and then, but I live in a quite sparsely populated suburb, and this keeps happening way too often, and regardless of the time of day. It's really bad for my blood pressure for sure, as it is stressful to deal with it. I need some peer support, and possibly even explanation for why it keeps happening. I've had a few experiences where I am convinced that I'm glitched, but this recent one freaked me out. Let's start with, I don't do drugs, no weed, nothing, I don't even drink. I have to let you know this because this story makes me feel like I should have been. I've lived in my neighborhood for 43 years. I take the same route to and from every day. As a child, my mother walked us to school on this route. So, needless to say, I know every street in my neighborhood. About three months ago, I had to go to work, so I went to the Little Caesars, and got my pizzas and my daughter, and I headed home. This is where it got inexplainable. I'm heading down, I make it about two streets, and suddenly there are two buildings on these streets that I have never seen in my life. Then, the one building-like factory, I see these men in weird hats and suspenders unloading an old truck, but the truck looked very new. Basically a truck from the 20s. I keep driving and then I noticed another factory and these other men in the same types of clothing are unloading milk bottles. I look at my daughter and I said, what the hell? I pull over and I get on my GPS. My GPS tells me I'm on the exact street that I'm supposed to be on. So I put the GPS in the holster and I make it a point to look at the streets. The street said central, so I knew where I was exactly. I get to the main roads of Warren Avenue and Central, and I tell her we're gonna turn around and head back the way we came. Well, I make the left on Warren, and I turn around under the bridge, and as soon as I do that, everything is normal. My street is there, the factories are gone, it's just normal. During these strange happenings, I felt a weird uneasiness in the air. I was literally terrified, like when someone is watching you. My GPS had a lot of static and my maps even looked weird. I don't know, like I said, I've had other events but this one definitely lasted the longest. I often drive that route on purpose now to make sense of what happened to us, but have yet to get an explanation. The funny thing is, I live in Detroit, so... Back in the day, there were indeed a lot of factories in the city. I found pages about glitches and stuff like that, and had I not had this one last as long as it did, I would think someone like me was crazy, or had some kind of narcotics, or was drunk. I don't know. Maybe I will be so lucky again to experience this, because next time, 
I'm stopping and asking what year or place I'm in. And I'm getting a flyer or something as proof that there's a glitch in this place that we call life. So, this actually happened a few years ago, and it's only because I've found myself here on this sub that I remember it. The weirdest thing happened to me and my boyfriend one night. So, for a little context, I'll just say that I live close to a motorway, and there's this one huge roundabout just off it that you can take to get to a couple of destinations. Anyways, it's a big roundabout with three lanes and five exits. The exit that takes us in the direction to my house is the second one as you come off the motorway, and it's distinct because it's the only exit on this roundabout where you have to go under a bridge, and it's all lit up. This roundabout is always busy because it separates two towns. So here's what happened, and it all happened quite fast. We came off the motorway and it was about an hour or so after rush hour, so it wasn't super busy, but wasn't dead either. We were driving towards the roundabout in the right lane, of two lanes, and we need to move to the left in order to be able to get onto the left lane of the roundabout and exit at the correct point. As we're about to switch lanes, another car, the same as ours, significant or not, cuts us up and we end up missing the exit. So I'm like, oh, great. We're going to have to go all the way back around now. This was annoying because I needed to go to the restroom, but hey-ho, so we start to drive around it again and reach the light at the third exit of the roundabout, which are red, so we wait. When they turn green, we set off, and then the weirdest thing happened. Just as quickly as we blinked, we were driving down the exits that we were originally supposed to take. We were coming out of the other end of the bridge with the lights. It was absolutely impossible because we had missed that exit, and we needed to do a whole other loop of the roundabout to get back to it again. Not to mention the fact that the exit road itself is quite lengthy before you reach the bridge. I use this roundabout multiple times a week, I know it like the back of my hand, and I've lived in this town all my life. At first instance, I thought it might just have been me being tired and not concentrating, but I looked at my boyfriend and his face was just like, WTF. So I said, did you just see that happen as well? And he was like, yeah, what the hell just happened? Absolutely no explanation for it at all, and we were just weirded out for the rest of the night. If you think there may be a logical explanation for this, please share, because I really cannot explain it. I'm posting this, wondering if someone may be able to help me identify what I experienced a few days ago. I went out to scrape the ice off of my car at about 4.45 in the morning, it was still completely dark and the sky was clear. The moon and stars were visible. As I was scraping the windshield, something in the sky caught my eye. I looked up and saw a square shape, as if cut out from the sky. It was a lighter blue color and fairly big. It looked as if someone had taken a knife and literally cut the shape out. It looked unreal. The sky around the shape was undisturbed. The light of it only lit up the square and nothing more. It was mesmerizing. There was an absence of sound that accompanied it, which added to the sense of something being very wrong. I was frozen in place staring at it. I was scared because it was so completely absurd and not natural. There's not usually much sound so early in my neighborhood. The highway is close enough that I can hear the distant noise of that. As soon as I made eye contact with the square, all of that noise was gone. Still frozen, staring at the square in the sky, I did nothing. I wanted to run back inside my house and wake someone else up so I wouldn't be alone. 
I felt like whatever I was seeing in the sky somehow knew that I was down there and looking up at it. I could not begin to describe the terror that began to take hold of me. And finally, the shape began to fade in a very peculiar fashion. It dimmed from the right side first, and then across until it was all gone. I had to fight with myself to carry on like normal once it had left. I couldn't understand what had just taken place. Here are a couple things I feel I should add. At 4.45am is my usual time to be up and outside. I wasn't overly tired. I think when I felt like it knew I was looking at it, it was caused by paranoia since my brain was trying to comprehend what was happening. I did try googling the shape, but I came up empty-handed. I don't feel like this is an extraterrestrial experience. Maybe interesting to add, ever since witnessing this, my sense of time has been off. I'll feel like I spent hours upon hours doing something, when in reality it's only been one hour. I sleep and wake up feeling as if I'm going to be late because I slept for so long, when in reality, I've only been asleep for around half an hour. I still feel super uneasy thinking about this, or talking about it. I know that may seem silly since it was just a shape in the sky. I truly wish I could show someone else what it was like. Has anyone heard of such a shape randomly appearing? Or anything like this at all? This happened back in the late 70s, long before The Matrix was conceived of, or the Wachowski brothers had hit puberty even, so my friends and I just chalked it up as weird. To set the scene, disco was at its height, and my friends and I were just of legal age to go nightclubbing and drinking, not that we'd not done it illegally before then. <laughs> And Saturday nights consisted generally of a group of us meeting up at our local neighborhood pub in the suburbs, and then heading to the city center to whichever nightclub got the majority vote that night. Me being a bit older than my mates, I was the only one at the time that had a driving license, so it usually fell to me to be the transport for the group, okay? My car wasn't the latest thing, about 12 years old at the time, but it got us where we wanted to go, for the most part. On the night that this event happened, there was myself and my two longtime best friends, plus the girlfriend of one of them. We decided to go to an out-of-the-way club that was situated in the back streets of the business section of the city center. Law offices, insurance companies, banking, etc. So, on a Saturday night, the streets were relatively clear, making for easy on-street parking. The few other cars parked around probably belonged to other late-night clubbers like ourselves. This section of town is laid out like this. Long, downhill, sloping main streets that are paralleled to each other, with shorter side streets linking them, block by block, down the entirety of their lengths. It was typical of that part of the old center, Birmingham, UK, and the mostly Victorian-era multi-story buildings. So, we all arrive, and I park the car in a space about halfway down the side street, which was literally around the corner from that evening's chosen club. Great, not too far to walk. We all agreed. And because of that, we all left our coats and that girlfriend's overnight bag on the back seat. Being a car from the 60s, there was no such thing as central locking, and car alarms were custom specialty items back then, so I had to go around locking three of the four doors from the inside, and then my driver's side door with the key, 
and then checking all the handles outside. Car crime wasn't really bad in those days, but it still happened, so I always had a mind for security. Plus, I was carrying my work toolbox and power tools in the boot, so that was firmly locked as well. That done, we all walked around the corner, left and up the slight gradient past two or three office frontages, and left again into the front door of the club. After a great night with me disco dancing most of the night with any girl that was keen, or even on my own, hey, it was the 70s, the club was beginning to turn out. Slow dance tracks from the DJ heralded the end of the fun, and we all gathered to leave. As usual for those days, having spent the night frantically dancing, I had sweated out the little alcohol I'd consumed, and was easily safe to chauffeur my pals home. We left via the main, and only, door, and, as a group, turning right and down the slope to the next corner to where we knew we had left the car. My heart sank when I turned that corner, though. The street was completely empty. Oh, crap, and other choice words. We all said mostly the same thing at the same time. The car's been stolen. It had been right there, at the curb, facing the corner that we had just come around. There was a lot of, what do we do nows, and me worrying that not only my car, but all of my tools were gone. What made it worse? Being the young bucks that we were, we'd blown through most of our meager funds during the night out, and probably couldn't even scrounge up the bus fare home between us. First things first, after much head-scratching, we all agreed that it was best to report the theft as quickly as possible. It was the days before mass communication, but there might be an outside chance that the car could be spotted by a patrol car. Panda cars, they were all called back then, and not many of them compared to today. While it was still being driven, and this meant a hike to the nearest police station. Remember, no mobile phones back then, which was on the other side of the city center. Quicker and easier than finding a call box or payphone in this part of town, and at that time of night. So, we all set off dejectedly in that direction, which meant continuing along the short side street that we were on, to the next parallel main street, and up that long hill to the major road that joined all the main streets together at their top ends. Then, it would be a diagonal cut across the city center proper to the police station by the law courts. There was little conversations, but mostly it consisted of, are you sure you locked it? Yes, I'm bloody sure I locked it, I'm not stupid. Etc. And then wishing the worst curses on whoever had ruined our Saturday night. We had made our way on to and part way up the next main block, passing another side street to our left. Then, during that next block, we decided to zigzag up the streets to make our route a little shorter and roughly diagonal in the direction that we needed to go. By this time, the chill 2am air had sobered up even my two friends and the girlfriend, and we were just stomping along to get the thing over with as quickly as possible. As we simultaneously rounded the left corner to the next short side street, we came to a dead stop. There was my car, parked neatly at the curb, in a parking meter space and not looking at all abandoned or trashed, as if by joyriders. I know what that looks like, having been the victim to a subsequent car theft. It was all as we'd left it, fully locked, and with all of our belongings as they had been. Nothing had been rifled through, and thankfully all of my tools were still in the boot. Not so much as a hair had been touched, it appeared. We all looked at each other, double-taking and glancing back all along our route, in kind of a what-the sort of way. But it didn't take us long to rally ourselves, 
put on our warm coats and get underway, merely thankful that we didn't have to continue the grim march to the police station. We talked about it for about the next hour or so, and all the way home as I made the rounds to their individual houses, but we could not come up with a logical explanation. A 60s car was fairly sparse in terms of ignition security, but it still would have been a fairly skilled task to hotwire it, and it would have left some evidence of tampering, which was not the case. Likewise, the doors, and not as difficult as today's cars to be sure, but still requiring some small skill or keys to overcome the locks. And then, why would someone steal the car only to abandon it after a couple of blocks? Or leave the valuables untouched? We all knew where we had originally left it. There was no dispute about that, nor individual false memories forced on the others. We all headed towards that side street as we'd come out of the club, after all. We couldn't all have been that mistaken, and I have always known where I last left my wheels. I couldn't afford to be without them for my job. Bear in mind, we found the car one main street and two side streets away, uphill. So it didn't roll there by itself, nor could it be merely pushed there. I always left the stick shift in gear in case the handbrake failed, a sensible precaution on old cars, which made it nigh on impossible to budge, as well as the fact that it would have needed to have been steered around the corners, necessitating access to the inside. Added to that, the car was facing in the opposite direction from how we had left it when going around the corner to the club. If a thief had taken it, they were a very neat and tidy person, leaving it exactly in a meter parking space, much as I would have done had it been me that put it there. Well, we never did report the incident to the police, and although we discussed it a few times in the following years, we never came up with a satisfactory explanation, other than the OCD thief theory. But I guess that now I've found out about glitches in the Matrix, I can finally file this one away as solved. We all stepped out of that nightclub into a slightly different version of the Matrix. Simple as that. In December of 2017, we needed to get Christmas stockings for our first holiday living on our own as a new family of three. Being that our son was also one year old just the week before Christmas, and we had a trip planned to see the family, the budget was tight. I decided to settle on some cheap throwaway stockings made of felt that I figured we would just use to get us through this first holiday, and if they didn't hold up, or I wanted something else going forward, no big deal. My husband's stocking had a felt sant on it, with a glued-on snowflake embellishment on the toe to the sock. It was the last stocking of its design that wasn't messed up in some way or other, then hanging a bit shorter than the others. I was glad to have found it because it was also the last way I could find a matching set of three all in the same style. Our son had a reindeer with a scarf embellishment, mine had a snowman with a hat embellishment. Around two weeks into having them, my husband notices just one of the spokes on the snowflake embellishment is missing. Thinking our son messed with it and probably got it folded back or tucked behind itself somehow, I got up to investigate. Not only was it not just creased down, I really got in there trying to be sure, to the point that I was worried I would undo the hot glue holding the entire snowflake on. It was snipped. It was a clean cut straight across like a pair of scissors. Furthermore, I found the now cut off spoke on the floor beneath where the stocking hung. And we talked about how it was weird that it seemed trimmed off, and that it's a bummer because, even for being cheap, they made quite the cute trio. 
I threw the dismembered piece away, because it was honestly just not even worth saving. It wasn't a big enough deal to me. A week and a half or so goes by when my husband is again the whistleblower. This time, he's telling me the spoke is back, and asking me when I got a new stocking. Confused, I go to grab the stocking and show him closer, since clearly his eyes needed some help. I'm walking over to pick it up while telling him that I didn't get a new stocking, so he's obviously mistaken and just seeing things. Sure as hell, it's there. I tug on the piece that we both saw on the floor, and both saw me throw away. It's solid, like it never was detached. There's no evidence whatsoever that it was repaired, even though that wouldn't have been possible either. My husband didn't replace it either to mess with me. It was the same short, off-kilter hang that it always had, and was unique to that specific one in comparison to even the others at the store. An error in processing that made it obvious that it was THE stocking. We still have the questionable Santa stocking, and it has had its complete snowflake ever since its mysterious return. Major event? Maybe not. But the fact that it was experienced by two other people at the same time, during both instances, makes it interesting, at the very least. A couple of weeks ago, I had a glitch happen to me at work. A little background first. I, 44, female, am used to stuff disappearing only to show up later where I had originally left it. This is important to the story because I always feel like I'm losing stuff only to find it later. Sometimes hours, sometimes days but it will usually show up where I was sure it was supposed to be. My husband often finds stuff for me too, and always where I was sure that I had left the item. Also, I don't drink, and I don't partake in mind-altering recreational substances either. Never have. Let me explain a bit about my job too, just so you understand the glitch better. I work in an office for a mortgage company. Now, this isn't a place where people come in to acquire a mortgage for a house. This is a place where legal documents are created for mortgages in different states of the mortgage life. For instance, I work in the lien release department. The documents that I work with are the ones that release a person from the bank once their mortgage is paid in full. Mostly what happens with my specific job is that I receive documents from the client, or rather the bank that holds the mortgage, which have been signed by said client. I check in these loans by running reports to make sure they're good to go, and I send them to the account they're supposed to go to, to be recorded. Each client is also referred to as a project, and each project has a lead over that project. I work on roughly 25 different projects, but I'm not the lead over any of them. If there is an issue, however, I email the lead letting them know the issue and put the documents aside until the lead can get back to me about the document that is having the issue. Now that I have the background for the story out of the way, let's move on to the actual glitch. A day or two before the glitch happened, I received a loan that had an issue. I messaged the team lead about the issue and put the documents aside in a stacker tower so it would be safe for when the lead got back to me. I should also mention that each one of my projects have a different color cover sheet so I can more easily locate them when I need them again. And some projects do share the same color of cover sheet, but the project name and specific information is handwritten on every paper by me so I can easily identify when I need it again. A day or two later, the team lead finally emailed me back about the issue and what to do to fix the problem. I pulled out all the loans that had issues to look for this specific loan. I knew that the cover sheet was purple, so I looked for purple cover sheets. The loan wasn't there. Not only that, 
There were no purple cover sheets at all in this relatively small stack of papers. There weren't many loans there as it was, only three others. I thought that maybe I accidentally put it somewhere else. I searched every possible place that I could have absent-mindedly put it, but it was nowhere. I checked through the same papers again, in the slot of the stacker that I reserved for loan issues, on which I'm waiting for the answer. Still not there. I email the team lead and apologize about losing the papers. He informed me that he would let the client know that the papers went missing, and will ask if they can sign another one to send it out. I felt terrible. I searched several times throughout the day just to make sure that I wasn't just missing them somewhere. After all, I am notorious when it comes to losing things. After work, I went home, not worrying about it. I'm actually one of those people who leaves work at work and doesn't think about it when I'm off the clock. I'm a mom when I get home, and with a rebunctious six-year-old boy with special needs that requires a lot of attention, my mind has other things that occupy it. I know a lot of people still worry about work when they leave for the day, but not me. Anyways, I digress. The next day when I arrived at work, I look again for the documents before I move on and completely stop worrying about the missing loan. After all, The team lead already said he would contact the client about it and have a new one mailed out. So, I just moved on with my workday. Halfway through my shift, a different team lead emails me about a loan of hers which had an issue. I grab the papers to find the loan for this project, which has a pink cover sheet. But as I sifted through the papers, I see a purple cover sheet. I pull out the document only to see that it was the missing loan. I couldn't believe my eyes. My heart was pounding. I knew it wasn't there before, the many times that I had looked. There were only three documents there that had issues, and none of them had purple cover sheets. I sent a message to the team lead via Teams messages to let him know that I found it. He was very happy about it, and he informed me to just process it out to the county and that he would let the client know that it had been found. I really don't know what happened. I looked so many times, and it was not there. This kind of stuff happens to me all the time. It's stuff like this that makes me want to believe that maybe our lives are nothing more than a simulation. I run a custom trim shop slash hardwood lumber yard. Both glitches involve longtime customers, guys who I know on site. The first time it happened was around 2010. We had a few contractors who did enough business with us that they had accounts. They could just sign for material rather than the usual payment on delivery model. I'm not saying all contractors are shady, but... There are a lot of fly-by-night guys who say they'll pay when the job is done, but you never hear from them again. I get that not everyone has the capital to lay out for material, but I've been burned enough to know the difference between an established business and the cash-on-delivery guys. Anyway, we'll call this customer Mr. C. One day, Mr. C comes in and his left hand is heavily bandaged. Obviously, I ask what happened. Mr. C was cutting a piece of plywood on a table saw by himself. Halfway through, it started to fall off the table. He put his hand down to push it back onto the table, and he sliced the top of his middle finger, half of his ring finger, and all of his pinky finger off. We talked about it and agreed how table saws are the most dangerous tools. I actually know more guys who've been injured from nail guns, but I was being sympathetic. Anyway, I didn't see Mr. C for five or six weeks. I saw he had an order ready for pickup one day, and I made sure that I was in the shop. I wanted to say hi and check on how he was holding up after his accident. When I walked up to the loading dock, 
Mr. C and one of our employees were loading red oak baseboards into his box van. Mr. C was using both hands. Both fully fingered hands. I didn't say anything. I just helped them load the material into the van and made sure the paperwork was in order. After he pulled out, I said something to my employee about how I thought Mr. C had cut his fingers from his left hand. My employee just looked at me weird and said he didn't know what I was talking about. This employee knew about Mr. C's accident. He was there the day Mr. C showed up in bandages. I know that we discussed it, and nail guns. No one in the shop knew what I was talking about, so I let it go. Mr. C officially retired a few years ago with all of his fingers. My second glitch actually had a witness. July of 2018, I was eating lunch in the break room with one of our older employees. We weren't talking, just eating our microwaved leftovers and staring at our phones. He grunts and says, oh, Mr. K died. I was taken aback and he shows me the obituary. Mr. K had been killed in an automobile accident the previous weekend. Arrangements were scheduled at the local funeral home on Friday. I felt bad that I couldn't go to the calling hours. Mr. K had been a friend of my grandpa's. They were both carpenters. My kid had friends coming for a sleepover that night, and I wasn't going to cancel it to go to calling hours for a guy that I really didn't know. My dad was going anyway, so our family was still represented. Fast forward to January of 2019, that same employee walks into the office and says he has a customer that requires my assistance. That's our usual code for, here's a Karen that we don't want to deal with. I walk out to the warehouse and standing there is Mr. K. Longtime employee walks behind Mr. K looking at me with his eyebrows raised so high that they're disappearing into his ball cap. I was stunned. I greeted him, shook his hand. I asked him how he'd been doing. He said he's been fine. We found the couple of boards that he needed for his project. He paid and was on his way. As he was pulling out, our employee said, I swear, I thought he was dead. Amazed that I wasn't the only one this time, I agreed. We talked for a while about how we both remember reading the obituary. I went back to the office and called my dad. I asked him if Mr. K was alive, and he said that he hadn't heard otherwise. My dad didn't remember going to a funeral. I've only talked to my employee about it one other time. We just chalked it up to an oddity. But... It still weirds me out. I have a bit of a weird story that happened a few weeks ago, and I'm not sure if it was a glitch or if it was something paranormal, but I'm going to say it's a glitch until proven otherwise. I am open to it being paranormal, sure, but... There hasn't been anything else that's happened in this house to make me think we have a ghost or anything like that. A bit of background. My husband has been assigned to working overnights for his company for around six months. It's not something he wanted to do, and it's not something that we had planned on, but the guy that worked the overnights actually passed away unexpectedly, and they asked my husband if he would do the job until he was replaced. It came with a huge increase in pay, so he took it with the expectation that it would be just a few months, but that's honestly a complaint for somewhere else. The point is that he works overnights, and he comes home around the time the kids are getting up to get ready for school. He typically says good morning to them, sits for a few minutes, and then heads to bed after that. Unfortunately, 
He's gotten used to the sleep schedule, and he can't really turn it off on his days where he doesn't have to work, which I completely understand. On this particular day, he was off, and he had actually gone to bed a bit before the kids were up. He had come home from the normal time from the night before's shift, and told me that he was beyond exhausted, and that he was just going to head to bed. I told him I would let the girls know, we said goodnight, and that was that. I finished getting ready for my day, and by the time I went to leave the bathroom and head out of our bedroom, he had been asleep for at least 45 minutes. I could hear him snoring for pretty much the whole time. I leave to go get the girls up at this point, and, much to my surprise, they were already up and getting breakfast in the kitchen. The two of them don't usually get up on their own. They're both really heavy sleepers like their dad, and I mentioned to them that I was surprised that they were awake already. My oldest then says that their dad had come in and woken them up. I was a slight bit confused because he got home almost an hour before they needed to be awake, and there would be no reason for him to do so. Plus, he told me to tell them that he loved them and that he was sorry he wasn't awake to say good morning to them. At first, I thought that maybe he had just somehow forgotten that he woke them up, but again, why would he do so an hour earlier than necessary? I asked when he woke them up, and she tells me that it was about ten minutes ago. I responded that that wasn't possible as he'd been asleep for nearly the entire hour. The two of them both looked at me confused and told me that he had definitely opened their door and told them that it was time to get up ten minutes ago. They said that he opened the door, flicked on the light, and said, Hey girls, it's time to get up. And when my oldest looked at her clock, it was ten minutes before that moment. They both mentioned that they hadn't actually seen him, only heard him and saw the light when it clicked on. I really didn't know what to say. I didn't want to scare them or anything like that, so I just accepted what she said and moved on, because it was kind of weird. My husband was somehow in two places at once. He was passed out completely in our bed, and he had somehow woken the girls up. I heard him snoring the whole time I was getting ready in the attached bathroom. I could see the bed from the doorway. I know for a fact that he was in bed the entire time. The only logical explanation that I could think of was that maybe he had woken them up when he got home, but I really don't know why he would have done that. If that was the case, the clock would have shown a time way earlier than ten minutes before they had to get up. I don't think my girls are lying, they're both really well behaved and don't lie about trivial things like that. I did mention it to him, and he said that he didn't remember waking them up, but that he was also super tired, so if he did, it may have just been something that he wiped from his memory. As I mentioned, this is either a glitch or a ghost, but I'm leaning toward a weird glitch because it was something that likely would have happened if he had been up, but in this timeline, he decided not to stay awake. So, something in the Matrix definitely broke that morning. I guess I have a strange glitch, or personal Mandela effect situation that I haven't been able to figure out, and probably never will. My apologies if this is somewhat boring or too short. It's not really a long story, nor is it super crazy. It's just really weird to me, and I can't find an explanation for the whole thing. For a little context, I'm not huge into the paranormal, nor do I believe we live in a simulation, and I'm not under the influence of anything, etc. and so on. But this is something that has bothered me ever since it happened. My cousin, I'll call him Danny, was my best friend growing up. 
I lived in a neighborhood that had next to zero kids, so he and I would always be spending time together. My favorite childhood memories are from when he and I would play Pokemon Red and Blue on our old school Game Boys, because we would just sit there for hours playing through the game, trading the Pokemon, and battling each other to see who had the stronger monsters. In fact, it's because of him that I got my then favorite Pokemon, Alakazam. It's not really relevant, but to get Alakazam, you have to trade your Kadabra with another person, and then it evolves. There are a few Pokemon from back then that did this, and I remember that we pretty much finished the Pokedex in both games because of how much we played together. It may not seem like it's important, but I remember getting to the 150 mark on the game, which is not something you could do without two people, or at least two games and two Game Boys. When I was 12, Danny's parents, so my aunt and my uncle, decided to move to another part of the state. It was pretty far away, so we never really got to see each other after this, as my parents never wanted to go that way, and I couldn't drive. I moved on, though, and I grew up with pretty much no other friends. I'm not trying to garner pity, I'm just saying. Then, when I was around 17... My aunt and uncle wanted to have a good-sized party for Danny's 18th birthday and graduation. It was seemingly a really big deal for them, so they invited everyone over and wanted the entire family to come and celebrate. I was stoked. I hadn't seen him for five years, and I had planned on giving him a short speech during the party about how much spending time with him as a child meant for me. I was going to make a joke about how we spent hours playing Pokemon, and I wanted to get him an Alakazam card as a joke, only to find out that they don't print Alakazam cards. Look it up, it's pretty stupid. So I just planned on giving him my little speech and that was that. When I got there, I was actually thankful that I didn't get an Alakazam card for him, because apparently none of my childhood memories playing Pokemon with Danny ever happened. That's right, nothing I just said is a thing that happened in my current existence. My cousin Danny, the one that I spent hours playing Pokemon with, the one that traded me the Alakazam that I cherished and beat his Pokemon with a hundred times, he was apparently born blind. He has, apparently, never been able to see anything. Ever. And the reason that this was a big celebration wasn't just because he was graduating, but because of how much he struggled with trying to get through high school with his disability, and how proud everyone was of him for making it. Obviously, I'm pretty damn proud of him too, but I don't get how this is possible. For the record, this is the same Danny as the one that I grew up with. Same red, seemingly wind-swept hair, same bright green eyes, and same goofy attitude. Except, this Danny can't see, and has never been able to. Being unable to see means that there's no way he could have ever played the old school Pokemon games with me, and my entire childhood is one big false memory. I'm not going to lie, it actually hurts the hell out of me to know this, and there's really nothing that I can do about it. There were no other cousins that lived near me, there were no other kids that it could have been, and obviously I didn't just imagine it all or dream that it all happened. I am devastated that my best friend as a kid just didn't seem to exist in this reality. It's been years since all of this happened, we're both in our 30s now, but I still think about all this quite often, and I honestly miss the Danny that I knew and grew up with in the other timeline. Approximately five years ago, one of my coworkers at my old job didn't show up for her shift one day. The next time we worked together, I asked why she had called out the other day. We just so happened to be in the presence of one of our supervisors, and we were all standing close to the entrance. 
She told us that her house had flooded because her younger brother left the faucet running right before her family went out to dinner. They came back to the house being mildly flooded. Unfortunate, but not too crazy of a story. The next day at work, me and the same coworker and the same supervisor were standing in the exact same spot as the day prior, close to the entrance, and we were all talking. I asked my coworker how her house and family were doing. She asked me what I'm talking about and why I would ask that. I said because of her house flooding, and she became very visibly upset and bothered and demanded to know how I knew that her house had flooded. I became very confused and asked, does she not remember telling me literally just yesterday? She insisted that she didn't tell me about her house flooding and demanded to know how I found out this information. I was bewildered and convinced that she must be messing with me because she 100% told me and our supervisor about her house flooding. I turned to our supervisor and him like, didn't she tell us about her house flooding yesterday? Expecting an obvious yes in response. However, our supervisor said she had no idea that her house had flooded. It's the first that she had heard about it. I'm stunned into almost silence, and am incoherently babbling trying to explain that she definitely did tell us. My coworker cuts me off and says, There's absolutely no way you could have known about that. I haven't told anyone about my house flooding aside from our general manager. Not even, insert another coworker's name here, who is also her best friend. And if I haven't told her about it, why the hell would I tell you? She literally looked at me with disgust and stormed off. At that point in time, I'm still convinced that it was some sort of elaborate prank, and I asked the supervisor who witnessed this whole thing about it, and she still maintained that she was unaware about her house flooding. This disturbed me greatly, but it's just so insane that I was still convinced that they have to be messing with me or something. So, anyway... The next time I worked with Flooded House coworker, I said hello to her and she just glared at me in response and walked off. After that day, it was never the same. We worked together for another six months or so and she continued to avoid me. She was rude to me when we did have to interact and treated me as if I was some stalker creep that was obsessed with her. I swear on my life that she told me about her house flooding. I remember it very vividly, but her reaction to me knowing was so intense, I really don't think she was faking that. My supervisor also maintained that she never actually told us about it. I even talked to her best friend about it who also said she had not previously known about the house flooding. Her best friend told me that it was best to just leave the topic alone and to leave Flooded House Girl alone altogether. I have no explanation for this, and when I tell people about this situation, they just tell me I'm crazy or making it up. I don't know how to explain it. I don't even believe in parallel universes, but I don't know what else it could be besides a switch up in my timelines. I don't know. <laughs> it haunts me, though, and I think about it all the time, and it just makes me feel sick. I'm a 55-year-old man, and my daughter suggested that I submit one of my glitches to this podcast, as she is an avid listener. I've had many glitches happen throughout my life, but the one that I always tell, and that leaves me feeling crazy, is one like the movie Premonition. This happened when my eldest daughter, let's call her Diane, was in college. 
she was a first generation student and had a full rights scholarship, so our family was very proud. While in college, she met her first boyfriend, she never dated in high school, Isaac. Isaac was a junior engineering major when we met him, and even met his parents during his and Diane's one year anniversary celebration. He lived in the town where they went to college, and my family and I were two hours away, and to know that Diane had somewhere close to go in case of trouble was comforting. The glitch happened during St. Patrick's Day of Diane's sophomore year. So, although Diane had a full scholarship, she worked a part-time job at a retail store for extra cash, and that day she was working until close and had asked if I could send her some money before work, as she was between paychecks. Her mother sent it, and Diane texted me that she received the money and thanked me. She said she would text tomorrow as she said she had to pick up Isaac to be a DD for him, and she would spend the night there. Diane wasn't a partier, so I never worried about her drinking and driving or getting into predicaments. About 4 or 5 a.m., I got a call from the police department in Diane's town asking for her parents. I told them that it was us, and he informed us that Diane had been in an accident and was at the hospital in the town over from her college. He said he didn't have any information and that we needed to go there as the ER team was busy with life-saving measures. Within minutes, my wife and I packed up our other three daughters and flew the two and a half hours to the town they said Diane was at. We got a hold of the hospital, and they said they couldn't release information over the phone, but told us how to get there and which side of the hospital to go to. When we got there in a rush, we were told to go up to a top floor, and that Diane was there, as she and Isaac were taken into the trauma unit. When those elevator doors opened, I had this feeling in my gut that I needed to prepare for heartbreak. My wife and I ran to the desk and asked about Diane. A nurse pointed to a waiting room and said that a doctor would be in. The doctor didn't take long, and gave the worst news that you can get as a parent. Diane didn't make it. They said that she had put up a good fight, but a head injury caused a life-ending seizure when they were intubating her. The doctor gave us his condolences, and said that we could see her before the morgue took her, and that a social worker would be up to talk to us about moving Diane's body back to the hometown. Seeing my daughter like that is forever seared in my brain. All the tubes and wires and blood everywhere. She looked like her, but not. Isaac's parents stopped over and hugged us as they said Isaac didn't make it either, but he was killed on impact. Apparently, a car full of college-aged girls were driving drunk and turned left at a red light without stopping and went full speed head-on with Diane and Isaac. Isaac's parents said the other party's families were there as well, and that of the five girls in the vehicle, four were killed on impact, and the other one was in critical condition. The next day was a blur, and my family was sleep-deprived. We didn't want to leave Diane, but we had to make arrangements. Although I was emotional and sleep-deprived, I knew that my daughter had died. We never received a call saying she came back. We left the town about 12 that afternoon after talking to a social worker and the police. When we got back, everyone was crying throughout the day, and we made calls to the relatives and our spiritual leaders. We're Native American, and we hold three-day wakes followed by a funeral, and usually it's open casket. After making calls, we realized that we would have to collect Diane's things from her dorm room, which we overlooked in our grief coming home. We called campus housing and explained what happened, and asked her information as we didn't remember her dorm info. The lady was very sympathetic and gave us the information and said that they would leave a note for when we go there. Now, I had laid down after that call, but I don't remember sleeping or waking up, really. 
I just remember sitting up, and the atmosphere felt different. I looked at the time, and it was the afternoon. I checked the rooms at the house, and none of my other daughters nor my wife were there. I called my wife, and I asked her where she was, and she said work. I asked why she went to work, and she said because she does every weekday, or was she missing something. There was no grief or sadness, nothing in her voice. I asked her if she remembered last night, and she said, what happened? And then she said, oh, and I sent Diane the money she asked for, just to make sure that she got it. I have to go. Hearing that confused me, but raised my hopes. Diane? Today? I checked my phone, and right when I did, I got a text from Diane saying she got her money, and that she was going to DD Isaac tonight. I called the number half thinking it would just ring, but my other half hoping that she would answer. She answered. To hear her voice made me cry like a baby. Dad? Dad, what's wrong? She asked in a panicked voice. I collected myself and said, Baby, I had a horrible dream about you dying, and I'm being serious. This is weird. I don't know if it was a dream or what happened, but you're alive, and I want you to stay alive. Diane was confused, and I told her that I was on my way over there, and I would take her and Isaac to dinner. I begged her to call in to work, and that we would have a great time. Just to appease me, she agreed. I let my wife know that I was going to see Diane ASAP, and that I would tell her when she got off work. When I got to campus, I decided to check something and went to the housing desk and asked for Diane's information. They said they would give the room a call. I looked over at their desk and saw no note about picking up anything from Diane's dorm. I heard them talk on the phone and they gave me Diane's info. Let me tell you, when she opened the door I hugged her so tight and I did not want to let go. She looked like herself and everything. I still felt sleep deprived from that glitch call, but I was happy. The rest of the evening went well and I went home and explained everything to my wife. We saged ourselves down and prayed for our family's safety. Diane is now 31 with two kids of her own, and every day I'm still afraid that I'm going to glitch again and go into a reality where Diane is gone and my grandkids don't exist. I have a fairly strange story about something that happened to me when I was a kid, and it was the first time something like this had ever happened to me. I was around 10 years old, and we had just moved into a new house in a city a state or two away because my mom had taken a promotion at her job, and they wanted to transfer her to the branch that was out here. Obviously. I was a bit devastated as I had to leave the school that I had been attending for most of my childhood, as well as leave behind my two friends that I'd known since I was a baby. My parents were adamant that I would just make new friends, so I had to suck it up and accept that we were moving. A few weeks after we had moved in, we were walking around the block to introduce ourselves to the neighbors and a few houses down was a man that worked for the same company as my mom, so basically one of her new co-workers. He had a son named Chris, which was my name as well, but I was Chris with the K. Not relevant, but as a kid it was the most important thing to me. For some reason, I never really considered Chris to be a good friend, but he was definitely an acquaintance of mine. I ended up being better friends with some of the other kids on the block that I actually met through Chris. After a few months, Chris and I weren't doing much together, but we still talked whenever we saw each other, so we both knew that the other was still alive. There was one day during the summer that a group of us decided we wanted to go swimming down at what was essentially a small pond with a dog. It was on land that was owned by one of the other guys, 
Johnny. So, we were allowed to mess around in it as much as we wanted to. Altogether, it was about seven of us that headed down to the pond to swim. We were all just swimming and having a good time, mostly just running and doing cannonballs off the dock and into the water. When it was my turn to jump into the water, I got up on the dock and prepared to run. But then, near the edge, I ended up slipping and fell backwards, hitting my head on the post. When this happened, I remembered slipping, and basically falling in slow motion. Then, my head hit the wood, and I remember there just being this sharp pain. The next thing I can recall is falling into the water and not being able to move. Like, at all. I was staring up at the surface of the water unable to close my eyes, just thinking about how I was dead. Like I said, I was only 10 or 11 at the time, so I really should have had no frame of reference for what death felt like, but I knew right then and there that I was either dying or had died, and my brain just hadn't powered off yet. I could feel that my lungs were empty, and I remember the taste of water as it filled my mouth. Then, I remember seeing Chris swimming down towards me with his hands out, like he was my savior, and then it all went black. When I woke up, I was lying on the ground outside the pond with Johnny's parents leaning over me and the boys all panicking in the background. When I came to, I literally gasped for air, and I remember coughing really hard and spitting out a bunch of water, and I could hear Johnny's dad asking me if I could hear him. I nodded that I could, and just kind of laid there staring up at the sky and watching the clouds. The other boys had gone from panicking to celebrating, I'm guessing because I didn't die. <laughs> I remember sitting up and asking what happened. Johnny said that I had slipped and hit my head, and then fell into the water. It slowly came back, and I remember finishing off what he said with, Oh yeah, and then Chris jumped in to save me. I then looked around to thank him, and I realized he wasn't there. I asked where he went, and they all kind of just looked at me. Johnny laughed and said, Dude, you're Chris. To which I said, Yeah, no, Chris with a CH, the other Chris that was here. Nobody had any idea who I was talking about. They all just kind of stared at me and looked around confused. Johnny's dad said that my parents were on their way, and that I should probably get looked at to make sure I didn't cause damage to my head. I nodded along and got up slowly to sit on the front porch waiting for them. On the way to the hospital, I actually asked my mom if she remembered Chris. I don't know why I felt compelled to ask, but he was the son of her coworker, so she would surely know who he was. To my surprise, she said that she didn't know anyone named Chris other than me. I told her, no, the Chris with the CH, the one that's your coworker's son. We met him right after we moved into the house, when we were introducing ourselves to the neighbors. My mom then told me that none of her coworkers lived on our block, and that, to the best of her knowledge, none of them had a son named Chris. So, to this day, I am the only person that remembers my friend Chris, the one that I met when I was 10, the one that was my mom's coworker's son. Nobody else in my family, and none of the other childhood friends knew who Chris with a CH was despite him being the person that saved my life, and someone that I know that I hung out with on several occasions. I know that he existed. I know that he and I were decent enough friends. And I know that he jumped into the water to save me when I was drowning. But yet, he seemingly never did. I have nothing to prove that he did exist, unfortunately other than the memories in my head. I will say that losing a friend to the Matrix, so to speak, 
specifically one that saved me that day, is the most painful childhood memory that I have. And while he doesn't seem to exist in this timeline, I will never forget that day, and the fact that he saved me. Okay, so I haven't thought about this in years, but this sub brought this incident back to the forefront of my mind. It was July 4th of 2011, and obviously in the US, that's Independence Day, so I got together with a group of friends to go out. But because the 4th of July was on a weekday that year, I had an early shift the following day, so I decided that I shouldn't get drunk. The night was fun, but around 8, I decided I should try to get back to my side of town before the fireworks started, because I figured traffic and people drunk driving would get worse if I stayed at my friend's house until after the fireworks. So I'm driving up this narrow side street going up towards my house. But this side street is one many of the locals use to get from my neighborhood to our south side, which is a major drinking and partying hotspot. Anyway, I had on this very distinctive and obnoxious American flag shirt, where the Badise part had red and white stripes, and the arms were blue with white stars. I bought the shirt from a thrift store, and I had never seen anyone wear something similar, but... Who knows? Anyway, as I'm driving down the street, I see what looks like a woman with a similar shirt as mine passed out face down on the sidewalk. Like, she looked like something was seriously wrong, too. Like she had face planted into the ground or something. So I decided to pull over and go and check on her, but because the street is so narrow, you can't just double park. You have to go and find a place to pull over. So, I park down the block and go back to help this lady. I've been down this road many times throughout my life, so I know the landmarks well, and I knew exactly where she had been laying. Also, even though I had to park down the street, I literally ran back to her, so it couldn't have been more than three or four minutes max. So I get to where I knew I saw her, and there's nothing. No sign of anyone, no one walking down the streets or anything. It was so bizarre, and I got the chills. So, I decided to just drop it and go back to my car. As I'm getting ready to cross the street again, this car comes speeding up the street towards me, and before I could even think, it crashes smack into the retaining wall right by where I was standing, just literally seconds before. Then this nutjob backs out and drives off. So one of the neighbors comes out and we call the police, and I helped file a police report and then went home. When I got home, I called my mom to tell her about what happened because I was still so shaken up, and she's the one who started putting things together, and made me really think about this as if it's a glitch in the matrix. She felt like I had somehow witnessed some alternative reality where I saw myself dead on the sidewalk. Because in that reality, maybe a car struck me earlier than the car that had arrived in this dimension. I don't know. I didn't really know what to make of it then, and I suppose that I still don't, but coming here on Reddit today makes me think it was maybe just another glitch in the Matrix. I don't know if this will post, it's my fifth attempt, but I've been fighting bizarre technological glitches that make me think the matrix or simulation we may be in is trying to alter who I am. Okay, I know how that sounds, but let me explain. Ever since New Year's Day, things like the fingerprint scanner at my job won't recognize me. 
The company insists it's the best one on the market, and no one out of hundreds of employees has single issues with it. They have to re-enter me almost daily. The tech guy has even said that I must deliberately be trying to mess with the machine, even getting to the point of him grabbing my wrist and twisting it to look at my fingers. I normally would punch someone in their face for such an aggressive physical contact with me, but he's related to the higher-ups in the company, so I'm not about to lose my job over this. I did say in a joking tone, hey, no aggressive touching without consent, do we need an adult or something? He didn't laugh. But this glitch is now regularly occurring, and only with me. My cell phone iris reader does the same thing, so I had to disable it and go back to manually entering the code to unlock my phone. I wish it stopped there, but the automatic doors in most stores are doing the same kind of thing, although not every time. Walmart, Home Depot, and at least four other stores that I go to walk in or out of, and the doors won't open. In the past few times, I stood there waving my arms like an idiot, walking around and just, nope, they won't open. Then, someone else walks up, and they open right away. Last night, a worker saw that it didn't do anything until it opened for the other person, and she just said, huh, that's weird. Now, this seems to be a pattern. That's spreading. I now have things like copy machines, several coffee machines, cell phones. They all just freeze up or do weird stuff. I went to make coffee at work, and it kept pouring the coffee instead of stopping. It wasn't like I picked a large and put in a small cup. No, it was set on large, the biggest size, and I had the proper sized cup. It just wouldn't stop. I had to shut off the power to it after it overflowed and kept going. Now I've been trying to post this for two weeks. My phone glitches, losing the post, or it doesn't upload it. Since the two weeks of my failure to post, people, friends, family, and colleagues keep insisting I am saying or thinking things that I'm not. I don't understand what is happening. A quick example. A person would insist that I'm thinking blue. I say no, I'm thinking red. The person will instantly get mad and call me a liar. For one, it's never anything important enough for me to lie about, and second, it's never anything important to the person to get so mad about, regardless of what I'm thinking. It's not just a job issue, it's simple things like my colleague insisting that I lied about what time I normally go to bed. He got so mad that he stormed out of the room. I sat there just thinking, what the hell is happening? I've been called a liar when I said that they didn't have any avocados at the store, for not being thirsty, for feeling tired, happy, and for not feeling or thinking anything. I asked why I would lie about stuff like that. It just seems that people now want me to feel a certain way, or to think a certain way and cannot process when I'm not. It's feeling like they're running on a script, and their fight or flight kicks in when I am off the script. I don't know. It feels like I'll never escape these glitches and never truly be free. I do just want to add, as I posted this, my phone went from 27% to 3, and as I went to plug in my phone to charge, the power went out in the break room that I'm currently sitting in. So I'm in the dark, and now on 1%. I can't take much more of this. It's gotta end one way or the other. As a child, I used to entertain this fantasy. I'm assuming the majority of people space out from time to time, 
However subtle or severe the semi-unconscious occurrence is presented, it's both unique to the individual and similar to the experiences of others. With that understanding, you can also identify the feeling of snapping out of it, or the moment when the zoning out ends and the alertness returns to leave you asking yourself, where was I, and how long was I there? To put it broadly, as an adult, it is more so an avalanche of thoughts that I can actually recollect, but as a child, it was more like waking up from a nap. I used to imagine that when this would happen, that the whole world was being paused. Everyone and everything was motionless, unaware, and unable to sense this pause the world over. It may have lasted a couple of seconds or a whole day, but everyone experienced it simultaneously and snapped out of it at the same time, then continuing about their lives without noticing. Everyone except me, of course. <laughs> I grew up in southwest Michigan slash northwest Indiana, and my family has 200 acres in Knox, Indiana, Toto Road for reference, that we use mainly for hunting. We hunt mornings and nights for two weeks straight when deer season arrives in November, only making occasional trips to town for necessities or dinner at a restaurant some nights. This leaves afternoons wide open for hanging out and doing absolutely nothing. One day, when I was 16, me and my cousin were talking and playing catch with the bouncy ball out in the drive in front of the cabin after the morning hunt, and we were probably about 75 yards apart. All of a sudden, he stops and turns around. He looks confused, and after about 30 seconds of watching him turn in curious circles, I started shouting something along the lines of, What are you doing? He started walking towards me, looking around quizzically. He got close to me before his bewildered gaze was then focused on me. He whispered, Do you hear how quiet it is out here? I laughed at how serious he came across at first. I was imagining something much more urgent seconds earlier as he approached me. But his demeanor ceased to budge, and without words demanded my full attention to his question. We stood there and stared at the ground. It was quiet. A quiet like I've never experienced before or since. This wasn't just quiet, this was an absolute absence of sound. As I realized he wasn't just joking around, my hair stood on end from the top of my head, and I got chills through my arms. Indiana is flat. You can hear cars and trucks from a mile away out in the country. When there's no cars around, the air is still filled with the noise of cicadas, birds, leaves in the wind. There was no wind. No wildlife. No motion to the surrounding area whatsoever. The universe, in this moment was unnervingly still and lifeless. So much that the leaves and the trees were frozen in time. You could have heard a pin drop in the sand. And this persisted, and we stood there exploring this moment for five minutes tops, not moving a muscle, let alone speaking and interrupting the pure silence. As quickly as it set on, a gust of wind that started weak and grew in strength gave way to a truck rumbling in the distance, and the familiar hum of insects and leaves rustling all around us. And this was perhaps even more unsettling, as the noise made the silence feel all the more real. This story is 100% true, and I would like to know if anyone here has experienced anything similar. There are two parts to this story. The first part takes place in the summer of the year 2000, and the second takes place in the summer of 2020. There had been several creepy and unexplained things going on in my grandparents' house since we had moved in two years prior, but this event topped them all. It was a hot, sticky summer night in northern New Jersey, 
The central air was on full blast, though, so the temperature inside my house was rather chilly. I remember falling asleep with my bed sheets all the way up to my chin. I was woken up for seemingly no good reason in the middle of the night. I turned on to my side and tried to fall back asleep when I heard a noise. The sound was a creak from one of the steps on the staircase outside of my room. A random creak wouldn't have made me bat an eye usually, but it was what I heard next that had me sit up quickly, wide-eyed and silently listening. Another creak from the staircase, and a few seconds later, another. Someone was sneaking up the stairs. Someone must have cut the alarm and it was sneaking up the stairs to do God knows what to my family. My 11-year-old mind was racing. I had no idea what to do. All I could think to do was keep counting the creaks and wait for whoever it was to get to the top of the stairs. I knew that there were six stairs, then a landing, and then five more stairs in the staircase, so it would take me 13 steps to reach the top. I counted the creaks in my head with bated breath. By the time the sixth creak sounded, I hatched a plan. I would grab the largest and heaviest toy within reach and slam it into the face of this would-be assailant once they got to the second floor. The creaks got closer, but they stayed the same speed. Slow and methodical. Once I heard the twelfth creak, in one fluid motion, I grabbed a large toy sprang from my bed, and spun around the corner to face the top of the stairs. I cocked back my hand to slam this toy into the face of whoever it was creeping up the stairs, but to my shock and horror, I was met with empty space. There was nobody there. The epilogue to this story came 20 years after the original events took place. On a cool summer evening, two years ago, I'd come home late from a night out with friends. I turned on my television and fell asleep in front of it, before changing my clothes, removing my contact lenses, and turning off the light in my room. I fell into a deep sleep rather quickly and woke up to find myself standing in a darkened hallway. It took me a few moments to get my bearings, but I finally figured out where I was my grandparents' old house. I turned to have a look around. The house was dark and quiet except for the central air blowing an icy breeze through the hallway. The house also looked and smelled exactly as it had 20 years prior. The thought crossed my mind that I must have been dreaming, but the odd thing was that I could feel pressure from the floor on the soles of my feet. I lightly touched the wall to my right, and I felt the cool, painted surface. Why am I here? I thought, and what am I supposed to do? I turned to my left to face the staircase leading up to the second floor, the very same staircase that I heard someone creeping up in the summer of 2000. At that moment, my purpose there clicked in my head. I recalled hearing the stairs creaking that night 20 years ago, so I did the only logical thing I could think to do. I started ascending the stairs. I remembered the pace at which I heard the stairs creaking, so I tried my very best to emulate it. I ascended the first six stairs slowly and methodically. I took two paces on the landing. I turned and began making my final slow steps to the top floor before a blur appeared in front of me. In the split second that it took my eyes to adjust to the dim light, I saw the figure of a small boy brandishing a large action figure, with a look of steely determination on his face. I saw myself from 20 years ago. 31-year-old me dared not make a sound as 11-year-old me realized there was no one on the staircase. No one visible, anyway. My 11-year-old face turned from determined to horrified at this realization, and my past self rushed back into the bedroom and stayed there for the rest of the night. As soon as my past self was out of view, I woke up with a start, 
My heart was racing as I tried to get my bearings. I jumped out of bed, cursing and questioning what had just occurred. I paced the floor of my room, so confused until I talked it out loud to myself. I finally concluded after half an hour that what I experienced 20 years ago, and also that night, it was not a dream. I conducted some research on the internet, and I found the closest thing to what I had experienced was called astral projection. From what I understand, for some reason, your soul leaves your physical body and travels elsewhere, through space and time, and potentially other dimensions. My soul inexplicably traveled out of my body and went to the past to give my 11-year-old self a scare. I ended up coming to the conclusion that the random trip to the past had an extremely convoluted purpose. I no longer had to be scared of whatever was on the stairs that night, because the thing that walked up the stairs on that night 20 years ago was me. Back in 2018, I was 17 years old and had come back from abroad to visit my friends in my home city for the winter. I remember it was the cold month of December and I was walking back to my apartment after a medical appointment with my mother when I happened to pass by this very old abandoned drama theater that was built in the 1800s, where my grandfather had temporarily worked in his youth which had been closed ever since the 90s. I recall that I hadn't been on that street for a long time, since my childhood, because I would always avoid the old drama theater buildings, as it gave me very strange vibes, so I would always take the other ways home back to the city center. However, that particular day, I happened to take that route for some unknown reason and I took that road with my mother while we discussed my upcoming exams, until she stopped me at the intersection for some odd reason and told me I was going the wrong way. At that very moment, I saw a young blonde girl sitting in a very familiar blue opal car, playing her PSP 3000 in the car. She glanced up at me to look at me all of a sudden, our eyes met, and I felt an odd sense of familiarity and recollection. I froze for a bit in shock, until I heard my mother's voice and decided to quickly turn back. I went home as if nothing happened, and then realized that when I was a kid back in 2009, it was snowing, and I had seen an older teenager with highlights, makeup, and a purple winter jacket looking at me strangely when I was in the car with my dad in the back seat, waiting for my mother to get back from the local store a few blocks away. And that's when it hit me, that this person was actually me. She too had moved away quickly after locking eyes with me when I was a kid, and she was dressed in the same attire that I was wearing in 2018. It was almost as if what happened wasn't supposed to happen, I wasn't supposed to be there on that day. Even up to this day, I'm confused. How could I possibly have seen myself from the future, and for me to remember it? I've never told anyone about it because they would just assume that I'm a delusional idiot, or something. This has been something that I haven't been able to explain to anyone. I still sometimes think about it and wonder whether I just fell asleep with my eyes open, or had hallucinated the entire event, but I recall it as blue as daylight. I've even asked my mother about the event, and she blankly stared at me saying that I acted odd that day, wanting to go back to that place for some unknown reason. I don't believe in the supernatural, but after having experienced this event, I think there's definitely something there, which we aren't aware of. I have two really weird events that happened to me 
and I have no idea what to really make of them. Nor if they are actually glitches in the Matrix, but I figured I would go ahead and share them for the sake of entertainment, or whatever. These both happened a few years back. No connection between the two other than I was involved, and they both kind of happened while I was at work. Well, that and they were both weird as hell. At least to me. The first one's a bit short, but that doesn't make it any less freaky. I work as a server at a fairly large bar and grill chain. We get a lot of people that come in over the weekend, typically starting Friday night. So, it's not unusual for us to have a lot of people that are there ready to keep things flowing smoothly. There was one Friday night that I worked where it seemed like we were just not going to get a lot of business, which was fine by me. Obviously, this didn't make my manager too happy as we were eating labor hours with so many people on the clock but had no money coming in. He waited until around 7.30, which was typically when we would all be running around like crazy, but when business didn't pick up, he decided that a few of us needed to go home. He sent a few of the kitchen staff home and a couple of the wait staff, and basically brought us down to our weekday staff. While he was deciding who to send home, I literally said the words, As soon as they leave, we're going to get half a dozen parties in that door at the same time, and it's going to be a struggle. He laughed and told me that since we were past the busiest hour, it wasn't likely, as that has almost literally never happened since he's worked there. Sure enough, as soon as the last person that he decided to send home walked out the back door and left, we had literally six parties walk through the door. Six, which is half a dozen, and it wasn't just parties of two. It was parties of two, three four with kids, and so on, and they all walked in within the same two-minute period. Needless to say, he claimed that I jinxed the store by saying what I said. I was just more so proud that I had somehow predicted the number of parties that were going to walk in precisely. Even crazier, that was it for the entire night. We closed at 9.30, so about two hours later, and there weren't any other parties beyond those six that came in the door. It was a really weird Friday, and such a mundane event, but it was still really weird to me that it pretty much happened as I said it would. The other event was super weird too, but it kind of happened the other way around. It was the midday shift in the middle of the week, so it was pretty slow. On these shifts... I like to take my time and talk to customers a bit more, be a little more friendly, and this is especially true if they have a young child. I love children, so I love to just chat with the little ones while I work, as it makes it so much easier and makes me happier. A young lady and her two children come in, they get seated in my section, and I come over to chat shortly while I take their order. I get their food, and I bring it to them and then I come back while they're eating to just do my check-in. I asked the son, who had to be around four or five, if he liked his chicken tenders, and he looked up at me, deadpan stared, and says, Don't burn your house down. I asked him what he said, and he just smiled and said that he liked his chicken. Yeah, it was a bit weird, but I just moved on with my shift. That night... I was making dinner for my roommate and myself, and something happened with the pan that caused a bunch of oil to spill onto the burner, and it caught fire. I panicked, unsure of what to do, and I was just screaming as it started to catch the back wall behind the stove. I admit, I did not know what to do and I felt incredibly stupid, but my roommate ran into the room with a small fire extinguisher that we had that was rated for kitchen fires. She blasted it and put it out. I was just standing there with a shocked look on my face when she looked over at me and said, Jeez, Liz, don't burn the house down. As soon as she said that, I freaked out. 
The fire was enough to make me stressed, but the fact that she had said almost the same thing the kid said, and the fact that he had said it to me that day, it was seriously terrifying. Those are my two events that I can remember that happened. It is weird for me that they both happened at my work, and maybe the first one was a complete coincidence, or maybe my particular chilies just happened to be in a location where the veal between reality and the Matrix is thin. Who knows? About ten years ago, I used to work for a small call center that did tech support for some smaller internet service providers throughout the country. The call center was 24 by 7, and it was probably the most stressful job I've ever had. But it paid the bills, and in the end, working nights meant that I could still go to school. So I pretty much just kept with it and did my best. Working the night shift meant that you knew everyone that you worked with, because there were only a handful of you there at any point in time. So when we got a new guy, it was almost an event because it was such a rarity. My glitch actually involves a new employee that we got, and it wasn't just the fact that he was new to the company that makes me remember the situation. It's that he had an accent. On that night that he started, he was introduced, and I was over the moon because he actually had a very thick Irish accent. He and I chatted a bit during the introduction, and come to find out he was from Ireland and he had moved to the U.S. about 20 or so years prior. He told me about his home life, his family, basically everything that a quick introduction could entail. I remember even commenting that I loved his accent, because it was one of those things that I said that was weird, and I caught it after I said it. I apologized to him after saying it, basically fessing up to the fact that I shouldn't have said it, and he laughed and told me it was totally fine. After we chatted for a few minutes, he got pulled away from his spot to shadow one of the other techs so we could explain a few things to him, which was basically all of the training that you got there. He told me that he'd see me around, and I went back to work. The night ended, I went home, everything was pretty normal. The next night, I actually looked around for him, but I didn't see him, so I assumed they either had him shadowing someone else, he was in training with the manager, or he may have had the day off. The next day was the same. He was nowhere to be found. On the third day, I was a bit upset, thinking that he may have decided that this job just wasn't for him and didn't come back. I actually went over to the night manager and asked him if the man had quit, and he asked me who I was talking about. I said, you know, the guy that just started? He had a really thick Irish accent. He stared at me like I was insane and said that no one had been hired in the last couple weeks, much less anybody from Ireland. I stood there literally describing this guy, how tall he was, how he looked, his backstory, None of it rang any bells with the manager. I thought that he was messing with me, so I shouted for the other tech that the guy had shadowed, and he had no idea who I was talking about. I asked a few of the other guys, and they too told me that they did not remember a man with an Irish accent ever starting. I was the only one who remembered this man, apparently. Nobody that worked our shift had heard of a man with an Irish accent, None of them had any memory of this guy ever existing, with me being the only exception. I guess it is possible that they were all just messing with me, but to get that many guys to just pretend that somebody didn't exist for the fun of it, that would have been quite a feat. It was honestly really upsetting too, because he seemed like a cool dude, and I would have loved to have been friends with the guy. I work at a financial institution, and as part of my role, I coordinate training for all the new hires, 
within the first few weeks of their onboarding. The process begins when local managers send me the names and contact details of the new hires, so I can reach out to them for a brief introduction and set the expectations of the training material. Prior to the start of the pandemic, I would simply reach out to the new hire at their new office phone number. However, with new work from home changes, I would now reach out to mobile numbers and residential phone numbers. All in all, a very similar process to what I was doing before, just with the caveat of having to reach out to people at home. As per usual, I receive a new spreadsheet with the names and info of the new hires that I needed to contact when I came across a quite unique name. I picked up my headset and dialed the number provided. Conversation goes like this. New hire. Hello, this is unique name. Me. Hey, good morning. This is my name. Calling from the financial institution. Did I catch you at a good time? New hire. Yeah, this is great. However, could you please call me at my landline? My mobile service isn't very reliable at this area. I wrote down the phone number she provided, and we hung up. Immediately, I dialed the phone number and waited for it to ring. One ring, two rings, three rings. Older woman answers, Hello? Me. Hi, good morning. My name is... My name. And I'm looking for... Unique name. Can I speak to her? Older woman. I'm sorry, who are you? Me. I'm my name, calling from financial institution. She asked me to call her back on this line. Is she available? Silence. Hello? Older woman. What do you mean she asked you to call her back? When? Me. Um, I was just talking to her and she said reception in her area wasn't very reliable and to please call her back at this number. Older woman. I'm sorry, but that's impossible. The name of the new hire died three days ago. Me. Is this telephone number provided by the new hire? Older woman. Yeah, that's correct. Me. I'm sorry, I may have written down the number incorrectly. I apologize for this inconvenience, and I'm very sorry about your loss. I hung up, and I was lost for words. I somehow managed to write down the wrong phone number and reached a residence with a recently deceased person who had the same unique name. I'm certain I wrote down the correct number, but it is possible that the poor connection made me write a different number. I don't know what to think. Maybe this is an odd coincidence? Edit. I reached back out to the new hire's mobile number and I asked her to share the phone number again and confirmed that the number I dialed was correct. I was certain that she would give me a different number where the digits were flipped, and it might have just been a small dyslexia moment. I'm not so sure I was pranked by a family member, but it is possible that maybe a senior resident with a mental disability might have answered and given me that info. Regardless, I didn't question the new hire, as it is none of my business if the other residents live there, and have access to the phone line. The next call I made back out to her landline, the new hire picked up. So, I have one of those stories that is basically, I should be dead, but something in the Matrix decided that I shouldn't, so... Now I have no explanation for these events kind of situations. And I'm going to go ahead and say now that this story does include language and information about me wanting to end my own life. So consider that your warning. I don't know if I should call this some sort of quantum immortality, or if it was some kind of reality or timeline shift, but it was something. And to be honest, kind of haunts me. So this all happened back in 2015, back when I was pretty much at the deepest point of my depression. 
I won't bore you with all the details. I'll just give the cliff notes as to why I was falling apart. In 2015, I was 17 years old, and two events completely destroyed my life. My mother ended up dying from a very aggressive and seemingly sudden onset cancer, and I was, to put it nicely, sexually assaulted by my cousin at the Celebration of Life get-together. A situation that no one in my family wanted to believe, nor address, and still hasn't. Obviously, these two things happened pretty much back to back. My mom died, and my cousin assaulted me within about a week or so of it happening. With these two things weighing me down very heavily, I was not exactly what one would call a happy person. I was not coping with these two things well at all, and I was hit by a sudden wave of decision that I was just going to end my life. I decided that I was going to take whatever medications I could find or get my hands on in the medicine cabinet, and would also swipe a bottle or two from my dad's room, and would just drive my car off of a ravine or something. It wasn't a very well thought out plan, but it was what I decided to do. As a quick aside, I am not condoning these actions, nor am I saying anyone should ever do anything that I decided to do, ever. I'm just stating as a fact what I did end up doing. So, I got what I needed, I got it all stuffed into my backpack, and I told my dad that I was going to go for a drive to clear my head. I drove my car to a nearby park, and did what I needed to do, threw everything into the back seats, and took off back onto the road, just waiting for whatever was going to happen to actually happen. I remember feeling a horrible pain in my stomach. I remember feeling like I wanted to throw up, and I remember feeling like I was getting incredibly dizzy. I have to assume that all of these were just effects caused by taking meds and mixing them with alcohol. Or maybe just the alcohol itself, but it was definitely hitting me. I remember looking around for a ravine or a cliff or something like that, and seeing a spot that I could vaguely remember as being steep. The last thing I remember in this line of events is me slamming on the gas pedal, feeling the car accelerate, closing my eyes, and then feeling the car leave the ground. I very distinctively remember feeling the car leaving the ground. I knew what was coming and I was just waiting for it all to happen. But it didn't. The car never hit the ground. It never flipped, crashed, or anything of that sort. I opened my eyes again and was nothing shy of confused. I was pulled over and parked on the side of the road. The car was still running, but I was at a complete stop with all four tires on the ground. When I looked over at the passenger seat, Everything was just sitting there, all steel sealed and full, like I never followed through on any of my plan. I no longer felt sick or dizzy, just really confused and angry. I stared out at the road, at the woods to the side, and then I stared at the cars as they passed, thinking, how the hell did I not die? And how the hell did I end up here? I ended up shoving everything back into my backpack and just heading home. I obviously never told my dad about this, or anyone really. It's both really sensitive, and it kind of makes me sound like I'm insane. But I wanted to at least put it out into the world that I somehow reset to a point where I did not end my own life. I know what I felt. I know what I did and I remember pretty much the entire thing as it played out. That feeling of being on stable ground, after feeling the car go into the air, is the one thing that will never leave my mind. Mostly because the feeling of a car getting air is quite distinct. It kind of churns your stomach. Again, I don't know if this was quantum immortality or timelines or whatever, but 
it was weird to me and has stuck with me. And for anyone that cares, I'm about as good as I'm going to be for now. I went through therapy, and I no longer talk to anyone in my family. But I'm trying to make the most of what I have. So, I have a super simple and incredibly mundane glitch but I feel like I absolutely have to share it for a reason that some of you may find funny. You did a story a while back about someone that went to bed with a messy apartment and then they woke up to it being spotless. And then there were several commenters that made jokes about how they needed their own quote-unquote cleaning fairies from the Matrix. Well, I think I had a visit by those cleaning fairies because I experienced damn near the same thing, and it's actually kind of terrifying. First off, the obvious. I'm a guy in my mid-twenties with really bad ADHD. Like, medically diagnosed ADHD by doctors that pretty much told me that everything was hopeless, and that I wouldn't amount to much because I couldn't hold a thought for more than four minutes. I have my own apartment in a small college town, and I live by myself. The only person that has a key to my apartment is my brother, and he lives around 25 minutes away. And he's never shown up unannounced, nor has he ever shown up in the middle of the night. Being a mid-twenties dude with an attention deficit, I do have struggles with keeping my place clean. I mean... I keep it picked up for the most part, I keep the dishes done, my food isn't all over the place, and I keep the floor mostly cleaned up. There is, however, one room where my brain seems to go into a panic attack when I try to do any sort of organization to it, and that is my bathroom. I have a fairly small bathroom in my apartment, it's just the toilet, a sink with a mirror on it across from said toilet, and then the tub. I also have one of those over-the-toilet shelves where I keep all the extra paper and stuff, and I have all my things on the sink. When I say things, I mean face wash, soaps, razors, combs, brushes, cotton swabs. A lot of just various bathroom things are all sitting on my sink, and it is a disaster. When I try to organize it, though, I feel like the room is spinning, and for some reason, I freak out. So, I pretty much have just left it like it was and have lived with it being a disaster. Well, about a week or so ago, I was doing my normal routine of picking things up and putting them away when I told myself that I was going to organize my bathroom. I literally stood in the doorway and psyched myself up to do it, which sounds incredibly dumb now that I've written it out. Then, I walked in and started to move things, but I couldn't do it. I ended up stopping because my dad had texted me, and I never went back to finish organizing the sink. I think I took my dad sending me that text as the universe saying, hey, you can just finish it later. So... I shouted back, Ha ha, I'm not going to do it at all. Well, I think the universe then laughed back at my face. Because when I woke up the next morning, my sink was seemingly organized. There was no clutter, or things stacked on top of each other. My toothbrush and razor were appropriately put away, and the soaps were all where they should have been. Basically, it had been organized and situated in a way that it should have been, in a way that I would have organized it. The problem is, I didn't do it, and I have no idea why or how someone would come into my apartment to clean up my bathroom for me and then leave without stealing anything. I don't remember doing it, and I've never experienced an event where I followed through with something all the way and then just forgot about it. I wasn't cleaning it while I was talking with my dad, 
because I called him after he texted me, and I was sitting out on the back patio smoking while we chatted. I don't believe that I sleep cleaned it, but I guess that is one possibility. So, to those that were looking for a visit from the Matrix's cleaning fairies, just know that apparently they can visit you all as well. Just don't be surprised if they do it and you freak out because you don't know how it all happened. I thought I would post my other unexplained glitch here as well. And like I said in my previous post, I've seen slash felt a number of weird things in various national parks and national forests. I'm actually going to get my Wilderness First Responder certification this March because of some uneasiness last summer in a remote park. But really, only this and my other posts could be described as a glitch in the Matrix. I did a volunteer program after college, and we frequently went on nature retreats as a big group. And this happened in November 2018 at a campground just east of Mount Rainier National Park. It was so remote that no one in our nearly 50-person group had cell phone service. Our only tie to the outside world was a ranger that came to check on us once a day. We weren't allowed to have alcohol or drugs at these retreats, so no, none of us were intoxicated in the slightest. There were a couple of cabins throughout the campground, and if you walked through the trees a bit, there was a sizable lake. A few friends and housemates and I it wanted to look at the night sky because we all knew it would be full of stars. And this is Washington State, so all the trees are massive and block out most of the sky. The only place we'd really be able to see stars would be over the small lake. So, we head down to the lake area despite it being pretty cold, and there's two logs there for us to sit on as well. We settle in waiting to see some shooting stars, it was a running joke in our house that we needed to see five shooting stars when camping or in the woods in order to fall asleep. Four or five of us in this group all lived together at the time, so we're all steadily watching the night sky for about 10 to 15 minutes when this happens. It only happened for maybe half a second, but we all saw it. For the shortest moment of time, half of the sky went completely white. Just stark white. Like a sheet of paper was placed over half of the night sky, right down the middle. After a moment, one of us said, Did everyone see that? We all confirmed what we saw. If you read my last post, you know that I of course was wanting to figure out what it was. I never found a solid explanation. And similarly with my other friends, these friends also told me to stop talking about it whenever I brought it up months or years later. It wasn't scary to me, just, again, super odd, and I don't have an explanation for it. It made no sound and was gone before any of us could comprehend it beyond what I described. It wasn't lightning I'm from the Great Lake region, so I know lightning. And it wasn't an airplane, so... I have no idea. Someone told me about this subreddit after I posted on Paranormal, so... This is a repost from about three years ago now. I recently had another small glitch about this exact post experience with my mother as well. I figured why not post it here, where it belongs. I don't post much, but I've been holding this in for a while. I wanted to see if maybe any of you had had a similar experience. To get the story started, I'll have to jump back in time. Around 2015 or 16, 
I was getting ready to go out with my mother and grandmother to go to Hobby Lobby. And for those of you who don't know what Hobby Lobby is, it's a store that's full of art and craft items, candles, etc. It's like a Walmart for crafts and art. Anyhow, after I was done getting ready, I sat in my room playing with my parakeet because I had some time to spare. A bit of time had passed, and my mother, whom I told to get me when she was ready to go, hadn't come to get me. I walked out into the living room, and she was flabbergasted by my appearance. Not because of the way I was dressed, but because I had come out of my room. My mother claimed to have come into my room and said the lights were off, and she had checked all around for me and assumed I went to my grandma's. She lives right behind my mom's house. I told her I was in my room the entire time, and we both felt strange after that. Now, before this entire incident, my mother was very liberal, as well as a few of my other family members. A bit of time passed, and when I woke up one day, everything had changed. My grandma, who was strictly against tattoos and dyed hair, began doing so. She got a tattoo. She dyed her hair pink. I was highly confused and brushed it off as a change of heart. And that was until my mother became this kind of hardcore conservative overnight. It was all weird. And my other grandmother, who didn't like tattoos either, got one as well. Everything that I grew up with had just changed. Little by little, I've been noticing more differences in my family from what I had grown up with. I kept trying to make excuses for it, but nothing was fitting right. I'm still stuck here in this universe that doesn't feel like my own. Now, I've always been spiritual in the sense that spirits are attracted to me, and I connect with my third eye often but I don't know what to do, and I've read theories that once you hop, you can't go back to where you're from. And this isn't like a political issue, I'm not mad that my mother is conservative or whatever, it's just totally different from the mom that I grew up with. Things have gotten weird, some of my lifelong wishes have come true, but nothing feels right. Ever since I've realized all this, my brain has gotten strange. I suffer from bouts of disassociation, which at first I thought could have been seizures, except my soul feels like it's floating above my body. Nothing feels like it belongs to me anymore. My body feels foreign often. It feels as though my soul is trying to connect with a body that never belonged to it. I know. I sound kind of crazy, but I'm saying this with 100% honesty from my side. I was going to try to make a video, but I don't want to upset my family or scare them by making them think I don't care about them. I try to make this new life work for me, but nothing is helping. Does anyone know what I can do to adjust? I have memories that nobody in my family remembers. And I tried going to doctors who say I should get a brain scan and tests, but I can't afford that right now. They say I'm coherent enough to pass the tests, but I don't know why I'm having these episodes of disassociation slash minor brain seizures. I really highly believe that this isn't my world. Those close to me can vouch for me and... I can get screenshots of old text I've sent stating what I'm stating here. If anyone has any sort of idea what this is, please, I'm willing to hear it all. All I know is that doctors are puzzled, I'm puzzled, and nobody besides my boyfriend and closest friends know about this. If you've read this, thanks. This was a small venting session about my situation and I hope that someone might have some answers. Edited, 1204-2021. Someone asked me if any major events happened in 2016, and I forgot to mention it. 
the same year that I experienced an overdose. I was 16 or 17 at the time. I experienced the void. A pure, true, black nothingness. I can't recall if it happened before or after the room incident stated above, so I can't say what is truly the cause for this glitch. I originally posted this three years ago, and have undergone extreme life changes. Changes that never seemed reasonable or even possible, for that matter. I'm 22 now, and still to this day, believe I'm not in my world anymore. My life has 180'd starting in 2016. People I'm close to have forgotten past major events or conversations between us. I'm living the life of another version of me. I don't belong here, and honestly, I'm just living day by day. The only reason I'm back here updating this is because of the situation I encountered two days ago, which I have proof of. This recollection was told on a channel that I had been telling my closest friends that I wanted proof that glitches exist before I heard my story being told to me through my headphones. I messaged my mom immediately and told her, I wrote about our portal encounter and just heard it on YouTube for the very first time. She messaged me back, just moments later, freaking out that she was watching a paranormal show and the very second I messaged her, they were talking about portals. I have these screenshots and I'm so glad to know that I now have just a smidgen of evidence and that I'm not crazy. I know this story is going to sound weird and crazy, but hear me out. I'm not too familiar with this subreddit, but a friend of mine who's always talking about metaphysics, the Twilight Zone, simulation type stuff, loves this sub and keeps telling me to post this. In fact, no doubt he'll read this. Anyways, here's my story. Two weeks ago, I was about to get ready for a party at 6. Just before I started getting ready, one of my friends messaged me super excited because a boy she's had a crush on for the last four years finally asked her out, and he was coming with her to the party. While I was texting her back, my younger brother walked into my room and asked if I could drive him to his friend's house, which I agreed to do. Then. I went to the bathroom to take a shower and do my makeup. So, I got in the shower, but when I went to wash my hair, I realized that my conditioner was finished. I was pretty ticked off because I had only bought it a couple of days beforehand, and it's an expensive brand. My younger sister always uses up my things, so I knew that she had used it. She also trashed the bathroom leaving water everywhere and her dirty towel on the floor. So, I was pissed off, and I was about to get out of the shower in order to tell her off and get some more conditioner. But as I went to get out, I realized at the last second that she'd kicked the grippy mat that we have at the bottom of our shower tub up. Our shower tub is super slippery without the grip mat. So... As I went to step out, my foot slipped, and I fell with my neck down on the edge of the tub. Time seemed to slow down in my head, and I remember my last thought was, Wow, this is how I die? How stupid. But here's the thing. At the moment of impact, I woke up in a start back in my bed. I know it sounds stupid and cheesy, like something from a dumb Netflix show, but there's literally no other way to describe what happened. I was lying in bed right before I got up to shower the first time, but I don't remember falling asleep. And the thing is, I've been a lucid dreamer for the last five or so years, and if this was a dream, it was way more vivid than anything I have ever experienced. 
what weirded me out, though, was the exact same friend who texted me the first time messaged me after I woke up to tell me that the boy she had a crush on had asked another girl out. And she was pretty bummed about it and didn't want to come to the party. I was weirded out that there was some similarity between that and the dream, but I didn't think much of it at first. As I went to reply, my younger brother came in to ask if I would take him to his friend's house. All the blood drained from my face. He just stood in the doorway looking confused and asked me what was wrong. I rushed into the bathroom feeling like I was losing my mind, and I went to check the conditioner bottle. I know this sounds completely crazy, but the bottle was finished up just like before, and the grip mat was kicked up. At this point, I went to lie back down in bed, and I texted my friends to tell them that I wouldn't be going to the party. And I would like to finish this story up by giving a shout out and saying hello to the OP's friend who told them to post the story. So, hello Zane. I hope you're doing well. This all happened a long time ago, on a random Friday at a local skating rink. This was way back when skating rinks were the big things for the young people that wanted to get away from home for a while. I don't know if anyone that will hear the story will understand what I mean, because it feels like it was so long ago, but it was a thing that totally used to happen. Not relevant, but it really feels like the late 90s were a hundred years ago. Maybe that's because time has felt like it's flown by in the blink of an eye. Anyways, I would go to the rink every Friday night, and I would meet up with my girlfriends, and we would just have an awesome night with each other. For the most part, it was typically myself, Tiffany, and Amy that would meet up, and we would spend the whole time flirting with the guys that were our age and skating around to the music. On this particular night, all of us met up as normal, and we got into doing what we normally did. I wasn't really feeling the best. I was in a weird mood, so I didn't really want to skate around. But Tiffany and Amy were really feeling it, so they were out on the rink while I sat on the bench with some other girls. But I really wasn't having a great time. I was feeling kind of dizzy and sick at the same time. Amy and Tiffany skated over to me and asked me if I was okay. I told them that I wasn't doing great. They both asked me if I wanted them to call my mom to come get us. At first, I was against it. I didn't want to ruin their night just because I wasn't feeling well. But then, after a few minutes of still feeling dizzy... I decided that we should go ahead and do so. Tiffany went over to the front desk and used the phone to call my mom and told her that I was sick and that we needed to be picked up. After they called, they came back to me and said that my mom was on her way and that it would be about 20 minutes, so they were going to go out and skate for a little while longer while we waited. I told them that I was going to go ahead and wait out front of the rink for her and they said that they would just meet me out front. I went and turned in my skates, and then walked over to sit on the bench outside of the skating rink. The whole time I was sitting there, I felt like I was getting so dizzy and tired that I could barely keep my eyes open. I felt like I was about to pass out and collapse. I propped myself up against the building and just sat there, breathing heavily and feeling miserable. After a few minutes, I felt a hand shake me awake, which meant that I must have dozed off for at least a few moments, and when I opened my eyes, it was my mom. She asked me if I was okay, and after telling her that I was seriously feeling sick, she told me to wait there and that she would be right back with my friends. Within a few moments, she walked back out with Amy, but not Tiffany. 
I asked where Tiffany was, and they both kind of looked at me funny. I mentioned that my mom had brought all three of us up to the rink that evening, that it was myself, Tiffany, and Amy, as it always was. She then said that Tiffany didn't come with us that time. I was beyond confused. I remembered it being both Tiffany and Amy there with me. I remembered that it was Tiffany that went to call my mom to come get me. She told me that it was Amy that called, and again, reiterated that it was just Amy with us that night, because Tiffany couldn't make it. This was so weird to me. I was beyond certain that it was the three of us. I remember Tiffany being there, but apparently she never was. I didn't bother to question it any further because I was still feeling sick, and I just thought that maybe I was wrong, but I am certain that it was the three of us. I have no idea how it all changed, how it changed from Amy and Tiffany being both there to just Amy. In the end, they were right. Tiffany wasn't able to make it that evening, but... I personally remember things completely different. I guess it was just a weird thing that happened, or else I was in a completely different reality for a bit where they were both there, but then shifted, I guess, when I went outside? I really have no idea. It's the only time that something like this has ever happened to me, thankfully. It was too weird for me to ever have something like this happen again. But... Hopefully your listeners can enjoy this strange thing that happened in my early teens. I have a short and really strange story that happened to me and my best buddy a few years ago. It's one of those things that we can explain to some extent, in that we can tell people what happened but we have no damn clue what actually occurred. On this night, my buddy and I were going to a local baseball game. I won't say the team because it'll give away my hometown, but it's not one that typically performs well. Not that that's relevant. Anyways, we had a good time at the game, and we had quite a few drinks because we were losing. Bad. Despite this, we were not drunk. At least, I wasn't drunk. I was definitely a bit tipsy, but I don't ever drink enough to actually get wasted. But, because we were drinking, we had paid for a hotel room for us to crash in for the night before we went to the game, so we had somewhere to go. We got an Uber to the hotel, but before we went in, my buddy mentioned that he was desperately craving a Reese's. I laughed at him like, Bro, why didn't we just take the Uber to a gas station or something? And he just shrugged and told me that we needed to go get a Reese's before we went to bed. I again was laughing at him, but said, screw it, and pointed down the way to where there was a convenience store. We went to the store, and we got our Reese's, and then we started back to the hotel. And that's when the glitch happened. We walked out of the convenience store, and he stopped to open his candy, and it looked like the sky went from pitch black to as bright as the middle of the day for about half a second. It was as if someone had flicked the switch on to the sky for just a moment, and then immediately flicked it back off. Like, it went from black to bright blue back to black. It was the weirdest thing but we both just kind of stood there for a moment and stared at the sky. I'm sure we looked like we were out of our minds just staring upwards. When it happened, we both completely sobered up. Like 100% completely went from a bit tipsy to completely sober. It was super weird, and neither of us said anything to the other person, though we knew that we both saw it happen. We just walked back to the hotel and didn't say a single word. The next morning, I tried to bring it up, but he was pretty much just dismissive of it, 
saying, yeah, it was weird. And that was it. And to the best of my knowledge, the two of us are the only ones that saw it happen, and there's no way to explain it beyond what I said earlier. It was super weird and kind of creepy, but that's about it. Nothing like it has ever happened again, and I've only read a few stories that were kind of similar, but not quite the same thing. Though, if anyone has ever had an experience like this or has a better explanation than The Matrix Glitched, I would love to hear it. My boyfriend, Dan, and I genuinely used to love taking long, almost impromptu road trips to places that we've never been. Typically, in the spring and fall, around our birthday months, mine's in April, his is October, we would randomly decide on where to go, load up the car, and just head out onto the road. Of course, he would have to schedule the time off, and I would have to make sure my clients knew that I would be out for a few days. So, they weren't 100% impromptu. There was always some planning and scheduling, but we would pretty much randomly choose our destination the week of the trips. He and I have been together for close to 10 years now, and we did this every year from the fifth year we were together all the way to 2019. When we had the money and the time, we would just go. On the particular trip back in early 2019 that this whole glitch happened, we had actually planned to take a long drive from our home in Madison Heights, Michigan, all the way out to a place called Bryce Canyon National Park, in southern Utah. This trip was a particularly long one. It was about a 28-hour drive, so we had planned on taking a little more than a week off, and we were going to stop around the halfway mark, somewhere between the southwestern tip of Nebraska and the top corner of Colorado. If you've never driven that little section of this country, they're really isn't much there between North Platte and Sterling. But it's still beautiful, at least to me. I remember this whole plan because I recall how much we had actually planned out on this specific trip. It was a bit out of character for us to do so much plotting along the way, but we felt it was necessary due to the length of the drive. And while some people may say that we could have just gone straight through if one of us slept, and the other one drove. The problem with that is that I actually don't have a license due to a medical issue that I'm not going to get into here. But he obviously knew this and he was totally fine with driving and stopping about midway. Plus, it gave us more time to take it all in, which isn't that the point of road trips anyways? Back to it. The plan, as stated, was to leave our home at 5 in the morning. We would drive all the way out to the tiny tourist town of Ogallala, Nebraska, and spend the night there. This would be about 16 hours, and then the remainder of the trip from Ogallala to Bryce Canyon in the morning, which was only about 11 hours. Splitting it with the majority in the first half meant that we could go a bit slower on the trip throughout literally all of Colorado, if necessary, and we would still get there at a good time to check in to the hotel. We followed this plan as we had basically written it. We left home on time, got out to Ogallala, stayed there overnight, and then planned to head out in the morning. While day one was perfect, it was day two where things kind of went awry. We both woke up in a slight bit of a panic, because when we opened our eyes, we noticed it was already sunny out. Our plan was to head out around 5 in the morning, and get there at 5 to 6 in the evening. But when we checked the clock, it was already 8.30. For some reason, 
Dan's phone didn't charge and had died overnight, which caused our main alarm to not go off. And while this isn't necessarily the glitch, we checked the charger and the outlet. He unplugged the phone and plugged it back in, and it started charging. It was definitely weird, but it's not what the story is about. Because we woke up late, we decided to go ahead and just get breakfast since our plan was already messed up. We stopped at a local diner, and we had our food and enjoyed the late morning, and then headed out onto the highway at around 10.30 or so. This meant, if we drove directly, we would get to our hotel destination at 10 at the earliest. So, it wasn't too bad, but it was still way off schedule, which definitely upset Dan. I told him it was fine, and that losing a few hours was acceptable since we planned to take it slow today anyways. After a bit, we were on the road and back to a steady pace, so things were getting as close to back on track as they could. After about three hours on the highway, heading straight for our destination, Google Maps made a comment about there being heavy traffic ahead, or something about an accident. I can't remember, but it recommended an alternate route, and that would add about 20 minutes to our time. Again, Dan was upset, but we relented and took the route that it said that we should. Adding this extra half hour meant that we would get there at around 11 or so, and that we would be entering Utah somewhere close to 6 p.m. This is where the glitch actually happens. By this time, we had been on the road for three and a half hours, and we got on the road at 10.30 a.m. This means that it was only around 2 in the afternoon. Only a few minutes after we get back onto the route, Google Maps chimes in again and does its little, Welcome to Utah. When it said this, I chuckled and said, See, we're making good time. Which was apparently the wrong thing to say, because my boyfriend pulled the car over and just stared at the phone blankly. I asked him what was going on, because it kind of freaked me out. He just slowly looked back over at me, and then back to the phone, and then once more at me with that look of pure shock. At first for me, it didn't click, but he quickly explained why he was so confused. There was absolutely no way for us to already be hitting Utah. It's around seven hours to get from Ogallala to the Utah border on 70 West which is the highway we had been taking. We left at 10.30 because we woke up late. We had to add half an hour because of the accident, which meant that it was going to be seven and a half hours after the time we left at the minimum, which was going to be somewhere in the realm of 6 p.m. or later. The time that it said we had entered Utah and the time on the clock was 2.18. Based on this time, we would have had to have been going at a ridiculous speed to get there, and we weren't. He was adamant that it was impossible, but he reloaded maps on his phone, made me load it up on my phone, and he checked the clock on every device that we owned. They all synced up. We were four and a half hours away from Bryce Canyon, it was 2.18 p.m. Somehow, without any logical explanation, we had managed to get ourselves pretty much back to the original schedule, despite waking up late and the delay on the road. I didn't have an explanation, but I was happy to chalk it up to some kind of miracle. He was not. He was in a weird state of panic, but after a while... We got back on the road and pressed on. We got to the hotel at around 6. We checked in, and he went straight to sleep for the night. Which was kind of a bummer, but I could tell this whole thing had messed with his head. 
Thankfully, it didn't affect him enough to ruin our trip or anything, but it was enough for that to be our last road trip for a while. Obviously, we've missed out on a few because of COVID, but we didn't go anywhere at the end of 2019 or beginning of 2020. Mostly because of him. As much as he won't admit it, I feel like this whole thing has actually given him a weird fear of driving long distances, which is not something he had to deal with prior. I'm hopeful that I'll be able to get him to go on a trip this year, but I'm also not holding my breath. But anyways, that's my glitch, and it's one that I still don't have an answer for to this day. This is a cross post from r slash parallel universe, but I wanted people's thoughts on it as the whole thing is still a mystery to me, and it still sometimes gives me nightmares, though the nightmares become less frequent with time. Also, I'm going to add in a couple small details that weren't in the story of the original post, because a couple of people asked on the original and I can see why it would be relevant information to have immediately available in the post itself. Back in the summer of 2011, I was 19 and had relocated my living situation for a few weeks while I was in between apartments. It's a long story on its own. Due to my relocation, I was pretty far from my work, and I'd have to drive about an hour south on the Highway 45. At the time, I worked in Spring, Texas, and I could get away with a lot of stuff because we were too short-staffed, and I was one of the more experienced on our night crew. On my first shift having to drive to work from this new area, I ended up getting a bit turned around and lost. I was driving on what I thought had been the highway, but after a bend, it suddenly transitioned into a single-lane road, and then further down the transition to just a dirt road. Ever since it stopped being a highway, there were no areas to turn off. I left my place at around 7pm to arrive at work by 8pm for my shift. This happened around the midway point of the distance, so... Even though I didn't check the time when it happened, it would be a fair estimate to say the sudden change in environment happened at approximately 7.30pm. Thinking this was really strange, as I'd been up and down 45 a million times, and I never saw anything like this, I figured I would just drive until I reached a rest stop, or something, to check my location on GPS and turn around at. It got to be a little uneasy when I went a full 20 minutes without a single spot to stop at or turn into, and without seeing a single other car. I saw a bridge coming up and thought, okay, surely there'll be somewhere to turn around up wherever this bridge leads. Then, I saw it. You are now entering Atascotia. At this point... I was already going to be super late for work no matter what, and I figured I would just send my boss a text and all would be fine. No signal. Thinking, what the hell, I'm gonna get in trouble anyways, may as well check out this place for a few minutes and see where I ended up. It was very unsettling. The town looked like it had to have been abandoned for decades, Buildings all around looking to be falling apart and in terrible disrepair. Not a single building had a light on, and there were no cars or people anywhere in sight. The roads were a mix of some dirt roads and some normal roads in varying states of disrepair. Hell, I didn't even see animals anywhere as I drove through. I could tell as I drove that this town was essentially an island. Every direction seemed to have a beach and a bridge that connected it to land, at least from what I was able to see as I drove around a higher elevated area. After about a half an hour of driving, unable to find any signs of life, 
I managed to find my way back to the bridge that I came in on, and I got the hell out of there. When I got to work about two hours late, my boss called me back into his office to have a chat. I'd been working there since I was 16, and have never been so much as a single minute late, so he was willing to hear me out. I told him the honest truth of what happened, and he seemed increasingly concerned as my story went on. He and another coworker looked on a map out of curiosity, since they'd never known of any abandoned towns in the area, and they found some place called Atascocita, and they just assumed I'd misread the sign. But when they opened the Google Street View, Atascocita was nothing like the town that I'd seen. The only thing they had in common it was a sort of similar name, and one bridge that connected it from across a lake. But the town I was in was surrounded by water and had bridges connecting it on each end. I'm only in contact with one coworker who was at work that day, and he's convinced I somehow got a bustling old-style town like Atascocita, somehow confused with the long-abandoned ghost town, even though they had nothing in common just because we couldn't find any Atascocia on the map. Two years after, when I went back to live in Spring for a little while, I did try finding Atascocia again, this time with the intent of filming while there to prove that it existed. But alas, no matter how much I retraced my steps, I was never able to find that strange empty path to the bridge again. As a little end note, I'm typically not super comfortable sharing this story with many people, because for obvious reasons, lots of people would probably think I'm crazy, because I'm adamant that I was in a town that no one can seemingly find any evidence of ever having existed. From the few people who I have told over the years, I've gotten answers like slipping somewhere in time that I entered some kind of spirit world or something that I slipped into an alternate reality, and the most common was that I fell asleep on the highway. Though, while that last one certainly sounds the most grounded on the surface, for those who have driven on 45, I'd have 100% died if I had fallen asleep at the wheel in the late evening slash early night on that highway. Accidents are common there even among totally alert drivers. I'm not really sure what to make of it all. As unsettling as the event itself was, the retracing my steps later and not being able to find any trace of it was even more so. Honestly, if I ever ended up back there somehow, someday, I would film the whole thing. Edit. Several comments are asking questions about important details that would be simpler to have in the post. As for whether I ever went to Atascocita to confirm it wasn't where I ended up, I have gone there for that purpose. Atascocita is in a completely different direction from where I'd been driving when all the weirdness happened, but I still wanted to check it out for my own confirmation. And... I can definitively 100% state that I wasn't in Atascocita. The only commonality between the two towns is the kind of similar name and nothing else. As for if there were any street signs or traffic lights or recognizable brands like a Walmart being present or something, there were street signs, though sadly I no longer recall any of the road names. There were street lights that weren't working scattered throughout. I did see buildings that looked like they were gas stations and grocery stores, but none of them had a name on the building. I generally assume this is just from the passage of time. To clarify on a point in the post, the town was in major disrepair. Many buildings had parts of them that were just straight up falling apart or collapsed, and some buildings looked to have mild damage on some walls or the rooftops. As for the style of architecture to help everyone have a clearer picture, it was really tough to tell due to the state of the buildings. But 
the closest approximation I could use is Greek Revival architecture. The designs seemed mostly basic and simple, though there were a handful of buildings that had asymmetrical designs. It's hard to say if this was a result of the building falling apart, or if it was intentional design. Edit 2. Two commenters managed to find a single newspaper reference to the town from the 40s. I'm going to be diving into that along with a bunch of old maps to see if I can find out anything. I'll update with more info soon, I hope. And edit 3. Very important. I haven't yet looked at the old maps, but I did look at Texas's official census data from the same year the newspaper article that mentioned it was from, and I found no census data on it, oddly enough. That said, the publication Oil City Derrick in Oil City, Pennsylvania, has an article on page 13 of their October 8, 1942 paper that does mention Atascocia, Texas. This is huge for me, because this is the first time I've seen any evidence that the town ever existed at all. And a huge thank you to the commenters who made this discovery. The mention of Atascocia is brief, and I have no idea why there's no census data on it, but it's the only piece of evidence this town was ever a thing. So I'm diving in. According to this article, some kind of major discovery slash breakthrough occurred in Atascocia regarding oil depth research. And it sounds like they found deposits of oil there that were previously thought to be impossible. And that's all. That's the only mention from the article. And I still need to check maps to try to find it. And I'm a little put off by it not being part of census data for some reason. But there it is. The town that doesn't exist, existed. I'm still very confused regarding how I actually got there, though. There's certainly no such part of 45 that's like what I experienced. Nor do I understand how retracing the same path from that day it didn't lead me back to Atascocia. I still believe on some level that something supernatural that I can't possibly understand happened, but at least knowing that the town existed once is a little comforting. I have a weird thing that happened with myself and my mother that I don't know if it's a glitch in the matrix or some kind of parallel universe situation, but it was weird as hell. And honestly, it freaked me out. So to give you just a bit of perspective and show you how things are normally, I live about an hour or so away from my parents. And we're all really close. I have always been super close with my mom, and I genuinely love my dad. So, when I moved out, things were very difficult for all of us. Because of that, we made a promise that we would meet up every other weekend on Sunday for dinner. That way, we got to see each other on a regular basis, but it wasn't too intrusive and no one had to drive too much to make it work. Of course, it was always me driving to their place, so it was more to help me not have to spend too much on gas. Now, there have been very few instances where I was unable to make it, or had an issue that would prevent me from driving over to their place, and if that happened, we would either put it off a week, or they would come over to my place. Usually, we would just push it off to the next week, but they had been over once or twice. On these days, I would always leave at 1 in the afternoon to be there around 2, and I would stay until around 10, basically spending all afternoon and evening with them. If I was running late, I would always call them to let them know, or if we had to cancel, I would call them. Alright, so that all out there, 
there was what I guess you would call an event that happened during one of our weekends last year that was really, really weird. It was in October, because it was starting to get cooler, but it wasn't yet snowing. On this particular weekend, that Sunday to be exact, I was leaving the grocery store and had somehow managed to get a large roofing nail in my tire. Not sure how, but that's not really important. I just got home and saw that there was a decent-sized nail in the side of the tire. I did the whole check thing with soapy water, and sure enough, it was bubbling. So, not only was there a nail, it was leaking air. Because of where the nail was, I wasn't willing to drive and have it potentially cause a blowout. So... I called my mom's cell phone to let her know that I wasn't going to make it. Strangely enough, she didn't answer. I figured that she was probably busy, so I called my dad, and he also did not answer. At this point, I was a little bit confused. But again, they're adults. They aren't always glued to their phones, so I assumed that they were just really busy with something else. I called my mom's phone one more time, and I decided to leave a voicemail. I remember what I said in this voicemail verbatim. And yes, that is actually important to this event. I said, Hey mom, I wanted to call and let you guys know that we're going to have to cancel this weekend. I have a nail in my tire. I'm going to take it in this week, so we can just meet up next Sunday instead. I said those exact words, and I know that was what I said, because it's what happened. After that, I went about my business, made myself dinner, did some work, and then went to bed. Cue the next morning, where all hell had seemingly broken loose. I woke up to multiple texts and missed calls from my mother, but all of them were from that morning, around 5 or 6 in the morning. I immediately called my mom to check in, thinking that something had happened, and she asked me if I was okay. I told her I was fine, and I asked her what was going on. She then asked me why I never showed up last night, and why I hadn't been answering my phone. I told her that I never got a call from her last night, and then I mentioned the voicemail that I left for her, asking if she got it. That's when it got weird. She said, The voicemail you left saying you were running late? I was a bit confused, but then said, No, the voicemail where I said I wasn't going to make it at all, because there was a nail in my tire. We went back and forth on this for a while, but really weren't getting anywhere. So... I asked her if she and dad wanted to drive up for lunch or something, since I was going to take that day off, to which she agreed. They drove up, we went to get food, and then I decided to ask about what was going on that previous night, and I was blown away by what she said. My mom said that at around 11 that morning, she had gotten a voicemail from me that said I was running late and that I said I would be there around 4 instead of 2. She said that she tried to call me back, but my phone was going straight to voicemail, so she left me a message and then also sent me a text saying that it was okay. 4 o'clock rolled around, and they were concerned, so they tried calling me again, and once more my phone was going straight to voicemail. They had both tried calling and texting me multiple times, but I apparently was not responding to them. She said that they then called my brother, who lives around 15 minutes or so north of me, and asked him to come by and check on me. He claims that he got here and the lights were off, and that no one answered the door. They said that they had been trying to get a hold of me all night, and had even been calling hospitals and police stations to see if I had been arrested or gotten into an accident. She even showed me her voicemail, and had me listen to it. But it was the weirdest thing, because while I could hear my voice saying I'm running late, 
it sounded choppy, like it was fading in and out. They showed me all of the outgoing calls and the texts that they sent, and even the timestamp of when they called my brother. Based on this, he showed up at my house around 7 that night, when I was just sitting on my couch and watching Netflix, and eating some leftover spaghetti that I had made. I was seriously confused and conflicted. I told them that I had called, and then said that I had said I wasn't going to be there because of the nail in my tire, and I told them that I was home the entire night. Basically, my night was the polar opposite of what they said happened. I was home. No one ever showed up at my door. It wasn't like my brother went to the wrong place. He comes over all the time, and he definitely knows where I live. So, that's my one weird thing that happened to me in my life. And my one experience with parallel universes, or matrix glitches, or whatever. I lived one night, and left a specific message, but for some reason the wires of reality got crossed, and I was stuck in one reality, while they were in a completely different one. I have no logical explanation for this, and if anyone does have any ideas, I would appreciate it. Beyond that, it was just really freaky. While I experienced a time glitch at work last year in May of 2021, it was not my first time-related glitch in the Matrix. My first glitch related to time took place at the library at the University of California, Santa Barbara, during my first year of college. Note, this is a rather detailed composition of my experience. Originally, I had written about it near the time of the event in an email, before forwarding it across several email accounts, and then finally transferring my story to my long-defunct online journal. Rest in peace, Zanga in the blog section of MySpace. I finally decided to share this publicly, with a few present-day details. I attended UCSB from 2000 to 2004, I barely went out in order to not spend any money, if possible, and probably used all the credits on my meal plan for the school year. Quick shout out to Ortega Dining Commons for the takeout meals that sustained me during some all-night cramming sessions. As a bookish student, I spent a lot of time at Davidson Library in my freshman year, choosing the floor I would study at with no rhyme or reason. By the end of the school year, I could honestly say that I have studied on each floor of the library at least once, including inside the spectacular Pacific View Room on the 8th floor. Halfway into the first quarter of the school year, in the middle of October of 2000, I began preparing for my midterms. I was not the type of person who could study at home, treating my dorm room at Santa Rosa Residence Hall as my bedroom and nothing else. The glitch took place after I had taken half of my midterms. I had taken two of my midterms in as many days so far, and met up with my roommates at Ortega for lunch at around noon. Afterward, we parted ways as he headed for the university center, Yusen, to start his shift at the bookstore, thanks to a work-study program while I headed over to Davidson Library. I entered the library through the Davidson entrance since, at the time, it was the main entrance to the library. This shows my age, as major renovations saw the construction of a new library entrance and a wing a decade after I graduated and left the school. I headed for the Ocean's Elevator, a set of three elevators with access to all eight floors of the library tower, and I pressed the up button. The middle elevator opened immediately. I stepped inside, turned around, and pressed the button for the eighth floor. After a short wait, the elevator doors closed, 
and I went up to the eighth floor alone without stopping on any of the floors in between. When the elevator doors opened on the eighth floor, I stepped outside the elevator and took two steps and abruptly stopped in my tracks. I was surrounded by the exposed concrete floor slab, save for the elevated tile flooring I was standing on directly in front of the elevator. There was construction equipment and bags of masonry material everywhere, but there were no walls or windows to speak of. Undoubtedly, the place that I ended up was under construction and open to the elements. I went back inside the elevator to see which floor I was on, and the LED panel showed a number 8 with a down arrow. Tentatively, I went back outside and walked straight from the elevator due west toward the edge of the apparent construction area. In the distance, I saw the setting sun slowly dipping below the horizon of the Pacific Ocean. If you go to the beach to watch the sunset at UCSB over the course of the year, you'll see that, thanks to the tilt of the Earth. The sun sets over the Pacific Ocean during the colder winter months, and over the California mainland during the warmer spring and summer months. Seeing the sunset caught me off guard almost right away since it was not supposed to occur for several hours. After all, my roommate and I had left the dining commons together at about 5 minutes before 1pm so that he wouldn't be late for work. I was further shocked by something else I saw, or rather didn't see. I looked down at the USEN by the campus lagoon, and Stork Tower was not there. I mean, there's no way anyone on campus could overlook a bell and clock tower that stands at 175 feet, let alone from the vantage point of the 8th floor of the library. I turned to my right, looking due north, and saw the peaks of the Santa Ynez Mountains, covered in snow. As far as I knew, no precipitation of any kind had fallen yet in the Santa Barbara area since the beginning of the school year, never mind any rain in the local beach areas and especially not any snow in the local mountains. While I stared at the snow-covered mountains, a small plane emerged from just below my field of vision and gained altitude, apparently taking off from the local airport. After the plane disappeared from sight, I looked down and saw the rooftop of the original two-story library adjacent to the library tower. I did an about-face and looked due south toward the Pacific Ocean. In the distance, I saw Santa Cruz Island of the Channel Islands Archipelago, just off the coast. When I looked down, I was stunned to find that the four-story wing built just south of the library tower was missing. In its place were far more bicycle racks than I remember seeing previously, as these bike racks extended from the bike path to the edge of the library tower. By the way, I had only been on the eighth floor for about two minutes so far, so... I was somewhat surprised when I saw that the doors of the elevator I took were still open as I turned around. While taking all of this in, I snapped back to my purpose of being there at the library in the first place, and promptly headed due east for behind the elevators, where the Pacific View Room should have been. Unfortunately, this area was also under construction. I looked over this edge of the concrete floor slab, and I saw Webb Hall below. Given the distance between the library and Webb Hall, another building could very well fit in the open space. I looked up and in the distance, I saw the Mesa, an expansive neighborhood in the city of Santa Barbara. UCSB is technically in the city of Galetta, but that's a story for another time. The neighborhood diverted my attention for something I was not expecting to see. Streetlights. The apparent sunset meant that the streetlights were slowly turning on throughout the city as it became evening. I was not going to get caught in the darkness of an apparently unfinished library floor that did not have electricity or lights. 
nor did I want to stick around in a place and time that was very different from the one that I came from. I headed for the elevator that I took, since the doors were still open, and pressed the one button. The doors promptly closed and I headed back downstairs. As I made my way down, I had come to the disconcerting conclusion that some way, somehow, I went back in time. It wasn't just an abrupt change in time of day, either. I briefly ended up in the past, when the library tower was still under construction, while Stork Tower and the four-story wing of the library did not yet exist. When I reached the first floor, I stepped outside the elevator and looked to my right. I saw the long passageway connecting the library tower to the original library. Adjacent to the elevators were several payphones, as well as a dorm phone. My roommate and I opted to not get a landline for our dorm, since we had cell phones anyway. I turned to my left and walked towards the entrance that I had just walked through mere minutes ago. To my enormous relief, I saw the current serials section, which houses printed magazines, journals, and newspapers, and is located on the lower level of the first floor of the four-story wing. Next to the entrance of this section is a staircase leading to the ethnic and gender studies section on the second floor of the same wing. There were lots of people on the staircase going in both directions as I headed for the exit. I looked through the glass doors and realized that not only was I back in the present time, but also the same time of day as when I arrived there, just five minutes ago. As I stepped outside the library, soaring between Gervitz Hall and the music library was Stork Tower. I walked toward the tower and paused upon arriving at the entrance of the music library. I continued looking up at the Stork Tower, still pondering what I had seen while up in the library tower. I went inside the Yusen, found a table outside of a cafe, and studied for my third midterm until 5 p.m., when my roommate got off work at the bookstore. He was surprised to see me, of course. Over dinner, back at the Ortega, I told him everything that I had experienced just after lunch that day. He was skeptical, but he ultimately believed me, especially because he felt that my earnest recollection of that day's events over the years, and we still keep in touch to this day, was the only time that he had ever sensed fear in me. This was the one and only such event that I ever experienced during my time at UCSB. I've been to the 8th floor of the library tower countless times since, until I graduated. But I never went back in time again. I've taken my roommate and our friends there. I've taken my family there when my sister was exploring colleges. She ended up going to UCSC. She'd rather be a banana slug than a caucho, I guess. I've taken classmates and even a girlfriend there. Sadly, I was not able to replicate my experience of going back in time with any of them. During the elevator rides to the 8th floor, I would secretly hope that the doors would open to a construction site with random but prominent features from the university's skyline missing in all directions only to be disappointed upon seeing the scale model of the university as soon as the elevator doors opened on the 8th floor, and, ultimately, a long-ago fully-built library floor with a spectacular view of the Pacific Ocean, each and every time.